About two years ago, I was 13, almost 14 at the time, and I was still quite immature for my age and enjoyed role-playing as Mortal Kombat characters or fighting with my little brother, who is now almost 13. By the way, I live in Whitefish, Montana, near a place called Olney, surrounded by woods pretty much. I also have horses basically everywhere on our property. That's important for later to know. Anyways, me and my little brother decided to go outside to the back of my house where there's a road that is about 400 feet in length, leading up to, I would say about a uh, maybe eight round hay bale sort of section, to pretend to fight each other with wooden swords that we had custom detailed and made ourselves. I was cosplaying as Sub-Zero, and my brother was just wearing regular clothes, and we started walking away from our house towards the hay bales because we intended to fight on them. Now, once we had gotten about halfway there, which took like a minute, we were almost at the end of our horse pen that was fenced in next to our house, reaching out halfway to the bales. I remember my brother leaning down to tie one of his shoes that had a messed up lace on the right one, and, getting straight to the point, what we both saw still makes me very nervous and sweat when I think about it. I looked over at him and immediately heard a loud sort of trampling or sprinting sound coming from the hay bale area. I looked up and at them and I saw what I thought to be something resembling a human but was extremely tall. The hay bales were stacked two up and I think four across. And whatever this was, it was grayish white and ran behind the bales in what I assume a pretty much straight line. Then going past them and disappearing into the woods that went from behind the hay all the way around my house, besides the main gravel road that then brings you to the highway. I immediately freaked out and tried to yell to my brother right beside me, but only managed to basically talk super fast to him with an inside voice. He as well looked up very quickly because he had heard the running too. There was a sort of small pause where my brother sounded confused, and then, right as he did it, it came back running to the hay bales once again, stopping this time behind the third row of two stacked on one another. This thing though was so tall that we could see almost the entirety of the thing's head and then it ran kind of forward a little bit and then straight backwards towards the woods, never to be seen after that. Now, this all happened in the span of maybe about five or eight seconds and saying that whatever this thing was running is really a complete understatement. You see, it had been running at at least 40 miles an hour, at least, or fast enough where we could both barely make out what it looked like in detail, just the overall appearance. What I remember though is that it looked to me as kind of like the rake, but way taller and more slender looking and really gray. I remember my brother yelling, what the heck was that? And literally, so did I, as we full-on bolted back to the house in probably 15 seconds. I got there first, yanked my brother in the door, and slammed it harder than any other door I've slammed in my life, locking it behind us quickly. Of course, my parents didn't believe us at all, even though I was on the verge of either tears or a heart attack from the adrenaline. They said that it was probably a moose in the end, but I've seen moose at that time and since then, and... This, I can assure you, was no moose. Hopefully, I'll get a better answer here than from them, but if not, that's okay, I guess. And to be honest, I really just do hope people believe me. It feels like a dream thinking back on it, just as it did the day after the incident. It's kind of weird, too, that I remembered this again suddenly today while watching a military crawler horror story on YouTube. Probably because my mind is trying to block out as a false memory or a dream, whatever that event was, even though I actually have a second eyewitness in my brother. And quite honestly, if my brother wasn't there with me, I seriously would doubt myself. I would doubt that I would ever believe what I actually saw. But because he saw it too, and we both freaked out at what it was, I have no doubt in my mind that I'm not crazy and we saw something. Years ago, when I was pregnant, we were just getting ready to go to bed and it was late, about 1.30 in the morning, when this woman knocked on the door and my husband answered. 
She was clearly high and jittery and looking around everywhere. She asked if she could use my toilet. My husband obviously said no, this was not a public restroom. We both got a really bad vibe from her though. She was quite a big woman and clearly something just wasn't right with her. She started to try to open our security door at that point, rattling the handle, but we've always been very conscious of keeping it locked the minute that we walk in. My husband told her to go away and he shut the door. Then she started banging on the door, screaming that she needed to use the toilet. My husband opened the door again and told her to get lost or he was calling the cops. She stopped, froze, and for about 20 seconds just sort of stood there, staring at us. And then she turned around and walked away. We turned off all the lights and we looked through the blinds and saw her next door talking to two people at that point. I said to my husband that I think that that was a setup for a home invasion and he agreed. The thing though is that I'd actually seen this woman around before quite a few times so she could have known that I was heavily pregnant and that would make us a good target because we would have been compliant. People have a tendency to be more compliant when they're trying to protect their family and I think that she must have followed me home. Thankfully after that I never saw her again but even that is kind of weird right? We were on a road trip to Queensland and back. We were in no hurry so we were taking the scenic route. And at one stage we pulled up to a truck stop on a highway that ran alongside the forest. It was a very isolated place. So we were sitting there trying to get my son some snacks and just having a break when a ute pulled up behind us. The guy inside sat there for ages just sort of staring at us and I said to my husband, this guy's creeping me out, let's go. So we started to pack up and that's when he got out of his ute. He was walking towards us as we got in our car and before we knew it he was there and he asked for a cigarette. My husband said that he only smokes rollies and he didn't have any rolled and the guy said I'll wait. He never said more than that in the entire encounter. He leaned in and he stared at me with the creepiest predatory look that I've ever seen and this really weird grin the whole time keeping one hand behind him as well. Suddenly, he leant right into the car, and at that moment, my two-year-old said hi, and it was then that this guy just backed away like his butt was on fire. Didn't wait for his cigarette, he just bolted back to his ute and we took off. We always thought that he had bad intentions and just didn't realize that we had a kid in the car, and when he did, that maybe threw him off. We both agree that it was the creepiest encounter of our lives and we were pretty sure of his intentions. The really creepy thing though is that it wasn't until we were driving away that we realized that we were in the Belanglo State Forest where serial killer Ivan Malat had buried all of his victims. It was always a theory that he didn't actually do the work alone and that actually one of his brothers was involved but who knows. Anyway... That might not be related to this story at all, but it always just crossed my mind. When I was about seven or eight, my family moved into an old farmhouse in VA. I have a little brother. My brother is three years younger than me, so he was around four or five at the time. This house had an upstairs which had two rooms. My brother and I were very excited about this because we always had to share a room. He picked the room to the left of the stairs. It was nice, but in the corner of his room it had a tiny door that led into a sort of small attic. It gave me an eerie feeling, so I couldn't understand why he would pick that room, but he was just determined on that being his room. I, though, took the room to the right, which had a little window that looked out over the farm. It was great. We set our rooms up and we unpacked. Fast forward to a few weeks later, my mum decided that it was time for us to take a nap. In my room, of course. But for context, I had a little red rocking chair with Dalmatians with my name painted on it. It was really cute. I had definitely outgrown it at this point, though, because it was made for me when I was a toddler. 
And well, when we went to lay down for our nap, everything was okay. But then, out of nowhere, my brother started freaking out and screaming, clinging to my mother for dear life. My mother tried to soothe him, but nothing was helping. She asked my brother what was wrong. My brother pointed to the rocking chair and said, there's a little girl in Sissy's chair and she doesn't want us up here. He was so unconsolable that my mum had to bring us downstairs. That is the first time the entity made herself known. I never saw her, but I'd always feel her presence or have nightmares about her. The weird thing is that I'd only see her in my dreams if I was in my room sleeping. So as you can imagine, that quickly turned into my brother and I sleeping in my mum's bed. Most of the time she would target my brother, but he'd never stay in his room. And one night, my mum talks to me and my brother into sleeping in my bed upstairs just to have a break. We only agreed to do it if we could leave the light room on, but she agreed. Well, we all fall asleep and I wake up in my room. I'm alone. Everything is the same, but like I said, I'm alone and something is telling me to get up and go to the window. I don't know why, but I do. As soon as I get to the window, though, I see a little girl run to the side of the house and start crawling up the side to my window. Remember, I'm on the second floor. I'm sort of startled awake before she can reach me, and I sit up in bed and realize that I'm reliving my dream. I'm panicking, staring at the window, and again, something is telling me to go over to it. But instead... I just dart down the stairs to my mum's room and find my brother laying on the floor near the end of my mum's bed. We didn't say much to each other besides agreeing and we felt safe in your mum. I learned years later that my brother had the same dream that night apparently. Fast forward a couple of years later, we moved to a new home. We had to share rooms again but we were fine with that. We were scared from all the years of dealing with this entity. We thought that we would finally have some peace, but we were very wrong. Shortly after moving, the same stuff started happening again. This time, I actually saw her. It was dark out, and my mum needed something from her car. I tell her that I'll go and get it, and as soon as I retrieved what she needed from the car, I turn around toward the house to go back in, but I look over into the field next to our house, and... I see her appear and disappear, and every time she reappeared, she was a little bit closer. I never ran so fast in my life. I ran into the house absolutely hysterical. I told my mum and stepdad, and they were obviously concerned. Mum didn't believe that she had followed us to the new house, but now she did. We made the conclusion that she attached herself to my rocking chair, so... We moved again and when we did, we left my rocking chair at that house and since then we haven't seen her and I haven't dreamed about her. Growing up after this, I always wondered if she was just an evil entity or maybe a demon in disguise. I don't know, but something told me that there was something wrong with her. I do some volunteering at a hospital three times a week that involves me reporting to the hospital at 5am. I enjoy the volunteering, I've been doing it for almost two years now, and I've really never had any issues. Until last week. Last week, I was a bit early on one of my volunteering days, and I had about 30 minutes before I had to report in. I normally would have just waited in my car, but... I had been pretty stressed about things in my personal life, so I thought that I'd go for a little walk to burn a little steam and clear my head. After all, this is in a pretty nice area, upscale West Los Angeles, so what could go wrong? It's like 4.30 in the morning, so naturally the streets are all quiet, but it seems pretty peaceful. But then, up ahead, I see somebody walking in my direction. Kind of odd, I guess, but... I didn't think too much of it. Him being out here at this hour isn't inherently suspicious, I guess. After all, does being out here at this hour automatically make me suspicious too? So, I keep walking. We make quick eye contact when we cross paths. 
and I suddenly got a very bad feeling about this man. I can't explain it other than an instant instinct, but sometimes you just have a gut feeling about somebody, you know? That's what I felt when I passed this man, and I immediately went on high alert and made sure that he wasn't going to approach me from behind or something. Very soon after walking by this man, I'm talking like 15 to 20 seconds, I passed by one of those many parked cars on the street. This is Los Angeles, so there's a lot of parked cars on the sides of the main streets. Except this parked car is different. There's a man sitting at the wheel and the man waves at me and beckons me over. Again, pretty darn creepy, but not inherently worth freaking out over just yet. As I keep walking, I then realize that while the car was parked, it wasn't off. It was simply in park. Because this car starts driving in the same direction that I'm walking, and it drives at a pace essentially matching my walking speed, at this point, I've had enough, and my brain is saying, nope. So I immediately turn around and start speed walking back in the direction that I came from. Then, I saw something, in that moment, that absolutely terrified me. That first man that I encountered walking the other direction, which was probably like 40 seconds ago, was now standing pretty close to me. Like way, way closer than somebody who had been walking in the other direction should be. And then, he makes eye contact with me, and he starts walking in my direction. I am incredibly suspicious, and more than a bit nervous at this point. So because it's pretty dark out, I decide to play a hunch. My car keys fold out in a manner very similar to a switchblade, so I immediately pull it out, press the button to make the key fold out, and I stare at him for a second. I believe that he was caught off guard because he stopped walking for a second. And well, that second was all I needed. I immediately took off running at top speed, crossed the street, we're talking a Los Angeles main street with like six lanes of traffic and a median divider, and kept running down the street. Now, I'm no Olympian, but I was on the cross-country team at a D2 college, and I still run multiple times a week, so I'm pretty confident that I can outrun the average person I run into by a comfortable margin. Still, I didn't take any chances, and I ran all the way back to the hospital. So, what do you guys think? I'm not crazy, right? I'm not necessarily saying that I was going to be the next prominent murder victim or kidnapping victim, but there was definitely something going on here, right? So for the last two months, there's been some instances where I've woken up at around 3 or 4 in the morning to use the restroom and have noticed my daughter's door open after we definitely closed it when laying her down. We live in a smallish two-bedroom apartment. Our daughter's room is directly across from ours, and we typically sleep with our bedroom door open so we can hear her in the night if she needs us. We usually lay her down at around 8.30 p.m., and my wife and I are usually in bed at around 10. Our daughter has a Nest White noise machine that we leave on in her room to help her sleep. When her door is shut, you can barely hear it. When I get up in the middle of the night, though, I immediately know that her door is open, just off of the sound alone. And then I look across, and her door is not just open a crack, but completely wide open. I just have this eerie feeling. My wife and I don't sleepwalk, and when I'm up in the middle of the night, I'm pretty aware of my surroundings. Also, to add to this... Our daughter sleeps in a crib and is way too small to crawl out of it and usually when I notice her door is open, I always go and check on her and she's always knocked out. There's just no reason why this door should be open and I don't know, something is telling me that something is wrong. Anyway, I apologize if this sounds a bit rambling, it's just giving me weird vibes and I was looking to see if anyone had any ideas of what might be going on. This happened about two years ago. Me, my fiancé, and my best friend decided to go to this popular hiking trail near us. The trail leads to a giant rock that hangs off of a cliff. It's a beautiful look over the city that I live in, and 
It's a far walk through the woods. You're on the same trail going straight for most of the hike. The trail eventually makes a sharp turn, gets thinner and gets very steep. You really have to hike up this part though and then you reach an open field. You can see the rock above you and you have to climb up one more path that leads you to the rock. Now, even though the hike is long, the path is very easy and it's hard to mess up, considering that this is the only path in that area of the woods, that I've found at least. I've done it multiple times at this point, even hiked down well after midnight, after watching fireworks on the 4th of July. But anyway, the three of us decided since we were walking close to the road that leads you to the trail that we were going to go and visit. It was about 7pm so it started to get dark pretty quickly. But we didn't even make it off the first part of the trail that I already mentioned. It goes straight for about an hour until you get to the sharp turn. We didn't even make it to that and we decided that since it was getting dark that we should probably turn around. We all had our flashlights on and everything was normal. We never set foot on the path. The path is pretty much dark engulfed by the trees but there is this one spot where the trees open up. You can see the entire downtown area of my city and it feels very high up because this trail is basically in the middle of the hillside surrounding the whole town. If you've ever been to Pennsylvania then you'll get it. Anyway we got to the spot where the clearing is where you can see downtown but it sort of looked flip flopped. I don't even really know how to explain it but it looked like the town was sort of flipped like how you can flip an image on your phone almost. Like someone took the town and flipped it the other way if you get it. It was late and dark and we were tired of walking so I just don't think that we really took it seriously when we walked past it. I still felt the weird feeling though and I felt like everything was sort of backwards all of a sudden. That's really the only way that I can describe it as backwards and we all said the same thing to each other. It was my fiance who said something first which it's just weird because usually he'd be the last to say anything in a situation like this. All he said though was that he feels backwards. My best friend freaked out because she gets anxiety like that and she felt the same way too. I mentioned the clearing looked weird at this point and they all agreed with me. They thought the same thing but they thought that they were being silly. At this point though we should be close to the exit but honestly it felt like we were sort of going in circles. The path started breaking like the path wasn't even the same that we'd been walking on so we turned back around towards the rock to try to figure out where we were. We came back to the clearing and it still looked weird so we took pictures and I do have them still if anyone cares to see them but you wouldn't be able to make out that it looks flip flopped unless you live in the same town. We knew that we were at the clearing though because well it's really the only part where the woods clear like this and we knew that we were on the right path as we've never got off of it. We decided to turn back around towards the exit but it just didn't bring us to the exit. It also didn't bring us to the path that looked wrong and started to break. It was a whole new part of the woods in fact that we'd never even seen before. At some point as well we sort of stumbled across a door on the ground. It looked like a door to a mine maybe or something. We tried to take a look at it but there was no evidence of a mine being there. There are multiple mines in my city though so I wouldn't be surprised if this was just an old one and wasn't on record or something. But beside the door was about five or six white chairs with what seemed to be white sheets laying on the ground around them. Like a little piece of white cloth. Not very big, just pieces. There were also beer bottles. The chair was in a circle formation but there was no fire pit in the middle or anything just this circle of chairs. Looking back it could have been a little campsite someone had made but man was it scary at night when you're lost to find something like this. It genuinely freaked us out and every time we walked away it just seemed that we just made our way back to the chairs and the door again. Obviously we started to try to call and text people that we know for help even called my parents but nobody answered. It was late so I guess that sort of made sense but we were so lost and getting really scared and we were going to have to sleep up here at this point we thought. And eventually after walking what seemed to be in circles forever we just sort of walked out. 
like so fast the exit was right there we just walked on the path for a minute and we were out just like that almost immediately after we leave i then get texts back from people that i was trying to get help from and one more creepy thing just to put the icing on the cake as well is that there were like 1032 pictures taken on my fiance's phone at 10:32 p.m like a burst of them if you have an iPhone, they have these things called bursts where you can take a lot of pictures quickly. It was just so weird. The pics were all just white and it just made no sense. It's also weird how his phone took pictures while he had his flashlight on at the same time. The pics were taken during the time that we were lost and we didn't go back for about a year until me and my fiance decided to go back and try and find the path that we made it onto at some point just for peace of mind in the end. But, no matter how hard we searched, and I mean we searched pretty thoroughly to find this thing, we couldn't find the door, we couldn't find anything weird, no extra paths, no flip-flop of the city, except a giant meat grinder at one point. I don't know what that was about, but, man, I hate the woods so much. It freaks me out thinking about any woods or forests of any time. That's just one of the worst experiences for me though, but I've had a few others and honestly I just hope people don't think that I'm making this all up. I know that it sounds crazy, to me even, so I can imagine someone thinking that I'm lying, but I'm really just looking for a possible explanation for any of this. It's one of those things that just sits with me and bothers me to this day and my fiancé doesn't like talking about it either because there's just really no explanation. Me and my best friend, we still talk about it from time to time but it just goes nowhere because we've thought of every possible explanation that we can think of. So, any similar experiences or theories would honestly be great. When I was 18 and freshly broken up with my older boyfriend, I basically went crazy with dating guys. At the time, I also dressed very goth, even going as far as to wear a, a real corset and trench coat, mostly just enjoying the attention. One particular afternoon though, my friend or roommate at the time decided to eat at a local Japanese restaurant with both of us all dressed up. Our waiter was a mediocre skinny white guy who clearly was a little alternative but it was hard to tell really with the uniform. We joked about me leaving my phone number on the receipt or something so I hyped myself up and I did it. Late that night he had sent me a text at some point. We talked for a few days never really having a right time to meet up as I worked 40 minutes away from where I lived. He mentioned the boots that he wore meant a lot to him and some other odd things that just seemed like edgy jokes I guess. One really late night though, coming home, I was texting and driving, as any 18 year old does, and we decided to meet up. I was stupid enough to invite him over to my apartment, where it was just me and the roommate who had been with me before. Our other two roommates were not at home at this point. At first, it was fine too because... I was already drunk so I would just let him rant about whatever he wanted. He went on about his life, going to jail, medical bills, his parents etc. Eventually though he asked me if I wanted to see his tattoos and I was like sure. He lifted up his shirt and not only could I see the handgun tucked in his waistband but also his multiple badly covered up racist tattoos. One was even slightly covered up with a banana. I don't know what it was but I simply decided the best way to deal with this situation was just to appease him so I went along with it casually. I don't remember exactly every detail because it was over two years ago and I was drunk but he ended up pulling his gun out and putting it to my head asking me if I was scared. I was immensely confused and I tried to call his bluff saying that I wasn't which got him to put it away for a while. When we went to hook up in my messy room, he pulled it out on me again, saying that he wanted to do it with it out. I got mad and tried to fight him off and get it away from my head. Of course, I wasn't as strong as him and 
He hit me in the arm with it. And I mean, if you've ever been pistol whipped with a gun, then you'll know exactly how much that hurts. When I finally got him off of me and he realized that I was angry, not scared, he started acting like a crackhead, saying that I was crazy for not caring about him pulling a gun on me. He ran off, jumping the fence of the apartment complex and not even taking his car that he had come in. In the morning, his car was gone and I had a large bruise from where he had hit me. And while to me it was a funny story for quite some time, I now realize just how bad it could have all ended. I was asleep with my small baby and woke up for some reason, three something in the morning, and I felt someone grab my foot, a coldish, larger hand, grab the tips of my toes on the top of my foot. Well, I at first thought that I was dreaming and my feet were out of the covers, so I decided to just go back to sleep. I put that one foot under the cover, left the other foot out, because I like sleeping with my feet out, and I was almost back asleep when... I felt a thumb with pressure slide up my foot and then a hand grab with intense pressure the top of my foot. At that, I immediately shot up. My body was having intense reactions at this point. Goosebumps, rapid heartbeat, etc. I yelled my sister's name because she's the only one who had a key to my condo and I looked under the bed and everywhere in the room. I was terrified for quite some time after that but... It never did happen again, until just the other day. So, I'm in a completely different city now with my husband and second baby. My husband, he left for work early in the morning at like 4am. He said goodbye and I was half asleep with my feet out. And about a minute after he closed the door to leave, something grabbed my foot, the top of my foot, the same way that it happened before, but... It was only once this time. I went to go and see if my toddler was in bed, and she was, and she was fast asleep. But I guess I'm just scared. I can't tell if this thing is bad or good or what it even actually is. I told my husband, and he believes me, but he has no idea what it is and no good ideas to put forward. I guess I just really want to know what it is, and... So, if you have any ideas as to what I should do, then please do let me know. I live in rural southwest VA in Appalachia, and I heard odd whistling in the woods a few days ago at night. It all started when I was playing airsoft alone in the woods at about 7pm in almost pitch black. Yes, I live a pretty lonely existence and was walking around the woods behind my house. I got to a clearing on top of a hill and sat down to take a rest. And just when I sat down, I heard this odd whistling. It was perfect whistling, and whistled a tune that I'd never heard before. It was clear, and it sounded close, at least within 150 feet or maybe even less, and came directly from behind me. It would have had to have been in the woods and near the property line with one of our neighbors. It instantly gave me chills down my back though and I got the feeling of being watched. I, not being an idiot and having a brain, wasted no time in sprinting full speed down towards my house, hopping over rocks and limbs and all that. The whistling stopped shortly after I got moving but I still felt like I was being watched and like something was just off. I didn't see anything, when I did turn back to look while opening a gate that is, but that may be because of the darkness and the distance that I had moved. To be clear as well, there was no way that it was a bird, as the leaves on the trees haven't regrown yet and plus it didn't sound like one. It still stays cold at night as well and sometimes during the day even, but I don't know that much about birds I guess. What I will say though is that there were also no birds to be seen and everything else was really quiet. I also sort of doubt though that it was a person as I heard no talking, no leaves crunching, no other noises in fact. I should also mention the whistling started sort of out of nowhere and it didn't get gradually louder or anything. 
as if someone or something was moving closer while whistling. I've been in those woods a decent amount of my life and I've never heard anything like it before, not even once. I'll admit that I was a bit tired but I've been more tired before while being up in those woods at a similar time and I'm definitely not one to hallucinate or anything. The whole situation still gives me chills when I think about it. I've had the feeling of being watched before in those woods but those feelings have never been so intense and extreme as that one night. I was sort of hoping if anyone might have known what this was that they might be able to give me some feedback. Was it an animal? Maybe, but me and my family have dogs around the house and most wild animals stay away and I haven't really seen anything outside of a bear or two and deer in those woods. I should also mention the dogs occasionally bark randomly into the woods but they weren't really barking at that moment when the whistling happened. And quite honestly, I was just sort of hoping that someone could identify what this was. I'm not saying that it was paranormal or anything, but I'm also not saying that it was just a wild animal. It was too weird to be just that, I think. Many years ago, when my daughter was potty training, a friend recommended that I keep a travel potty with me. It saved me from rushing to find a restroom and avoiding stopping in anywhere questionable with a toddler. We would drive about 40 minutes to pick up my husband on his lunch break and that afternoon we were headed back to drop him off at work and were only about a block from the restaurant when my daughter said that she had to go. The area that we had just headed into, it was a large business park area with lots of very large buildings to the left and the right. I saw one and the parking lot looked empty. I pulled over to the side of the building and I parked at the curb. I had two car seats taking up my back seat and my husband in the passenger seat so I took my daughter out of the car and sat her up in the trunk to use the potty. I just got her settled and she was looking uncomfortable and covering her face and looking down. I looked behind me and I see a woman walking up to me. It was summer at the time and very warm but she was wearing a jean skirt and tank top and had a crossbody purse. She looked at my daughter and said, don't be embarrassed, we all go through it, and just laughed. She said that she needed a ride to the freeway and asked if I could take her. I told her that I was sorry, but I couldn't, and she started to seem bothered by that and asked why I couldn't take her. I said my back seat is full, so I don't have room for her, and she snapped back, so you're telling me you put your daughter in the front seat? I told her no, that my husband was in the front seat. And as soon as she heard that I wasn't alone and had my husband with me, she started to slowly back away and she was walking down the street that she came from. As she was walking away, she said, Oh, I'm sorry, I used to be from here, but not anymore, and quickly walked off. If she would have made a left on the cross street she was walking towards when going towards my car, There were restaurants and gas stations a block up, plenty of people to ask for a ride. So the fact that she went the other way has always troubled me. I still am very grateful my husband was with me that day. I don't know what her true intentions were, but getting to a populated area really didn't seem to be one of them. Back when I waitressed, I pulled into my mum's driveway at around 8pm and I remember that I was excited because it was an early night for me and I'd been working three jobs at the time. The neighbourhood was quiet and nobody else was really around, no cars driving by or anything. I was scrolling on my phone in my car when I just got a terrible feeling and a, a chill down my spine. Something was telling me to get out of the car at this point. So I got out and slammed my door when I heard this gut-wrenching scream. My first thought was that a raccoon was being eaten or a cat had gotten run over or something. I couldn't pin it what it was because it was just so disturbing. I'll never forget it though. It had so much pain and terror in it. I looked around me to find the source and noticed a figure across the street standing in the grass next to the street curb. The street light was in front of my house so I could make out some details. 
It was a girl with long hair covering her face and a long white dress. She had no shoes on. My first thought was kidnap victim for some reason and I wanted to call out, are you okay? But something inside of me told me to hold back. She didn't move or look up. I probably stood there a minute too long contemplating what I was seeing and if she needed help or not, but ultimately my gut told me to get inside now. Without turning my back to her, I opened my garage door and I backed in, my eyes never leaving her and she didn't move even an inch. I stood and watched as the garage door closed and she was still there. I ran inside, turned on the house alarm and ran to the front window to see if I could still see her, but I couldn't. Then I ran to my bedroom window upstairs because that would have been a perfect view of her, but she was gone. I slept with the lights on that night. My mum says the neighborhood kids were playing a prank on me, but honestly... None of them were her shape or size or looked like her. I've seen them all. When I told the story to some friends, some of them mentioned a banshee. While no one in my family passed away, I did have a near-death experience three months later. I don't know if it's related, but I think it's probably worth mentioning that. Anyway, I'm curious as to what others think. Was I just being pranked or did I see something that night? And if I did, what exactly did I encounter? And more importantly, why? So my boyfriend, now husband, moved into this house with three of his buds when we were 19. Built in 1909, you could only expect it to come with some history, right? Well, his room was on the main floor and... I'd spent evenings over just visiting. I came over after work one day and he was all worked up going, I swear this house is haunted, I'm losing it. He explained that as he did laundry, the dryer kept turning off and he would walk to the basement to find the door open. On his third trip to the basement, he just snapped. He yelled and swore and told the ghost to get lost. He slammed the dryer door and then walked back up to his room. The laundry completed and the door didn't open again. After explaining this to me, I realized that it was already 11.30pm and I had to drive home still. He was a bit on edge but I just told him that he needs to apologize and understand that this was probably their home at one point in time. They're just messing with him for a reaction. I kissed him goodnight and walked into the kitchen towards the front door to leave. I stopped in the doorway, felt the need to look over my right shoulder and see the elements on the stove beat red. They were all turned on at full heat and had been on for a while, clearly. The kitchen was really hot. The stovetop itself was dang hot. I casually walked over, turned off all the elements and said, please stop, he's harmless. Boyfriend begged me to stay and I was like, you gotta fight your own battles. You need to apologize and just go to sleep, you silly goose. The old man never left. It was his house at one point. He made certain everyone knew that he was still the boss. I sometimes enjoyed his tricks. I ended up moving in with the boys three months after the stove incident. Nothing too scary ever really happened. Just sort of regular ghost stuff, but it was kind of like Casper, I guess. Some people might find that odd, but I guess when you've had your fair share of paranormal encounters, things like this just don't seem to phase you anymore. So I was driving home at about 9.30pm. My route contains a variety of areas, including some single lane quiet roads. Driving along one of these single lane roads, I end up having to slow down because of a man standing in the middle of the road, facing away from my car. Now, I have my full beams on at this point, so there's no way that he doesn't know that I'm driving behind him. He apparently just decides to wait until I've come to almost a complete stop before turning around. Just turning around, that is. No sign that he's going to move out of the road or anything. I'm, of course, worried about this guy, thinking that, I don't know, maybe he needs help or something. He doesn't seem to be visibly intoxicated from what I can tell. And he doesn't appear injured or confused, so 
I assume that he's mostly okay. After a little while of standing, he raises his arms in a well kind of motion. I don't know if he was expecting me to back up or hit him or what, so I decided to sound my horn to try and nudge him along a bit, as I just want to get home. And this makes him flip out completely. He closes the distance to my car and starts pounding on it, yelling at me like crazy. I can't hear what he's saying, but he does this for what must have only been a few seconds, felt way longer at the time, before rounding the side of my car and punching the driver's side window at full force. Fortunately, it held up and it didn't crack. The second that I know that he's out of the way, though, I absolutely floor it and get the heck out of there, happy in the knowledge that he couldn't catch up to me. So yeah, that was a really creepy random encounter and hopefully my last one. I do hope that Mr. Spooky Car Puncher is okay and getting whatever help it is that he might need. Though, probably best to start with a doctor for his likely broken hand. This happened back in 2018. I was 24 and my sister was 25. We are both native New Yorkers and there are plenty of stories that I have. I think we all know that New York is a bit strange, but anyway, we were on a crowded train going to meet up with a friend. There were no seats, so we were holding onto this pole. It's already a bit of a tight squeeze, but this man and this girl, not related, get on and hold the pole that my sister and I are both holding. We're both talking, and I notice the man directly in front of us keeps on looking at us, like really looking. I'm already feeling uncomfortable as it is, and it's hard not to pay attention. I just try to ignore it by talking to my sister in the end. By the way, we are nowhere near our destination. A couple of train stops later, though, he eventually says to us, Are you guys sisters? We both sort of look at one another, feeling awkward, and I'm like, Uh, yeah... At this point, I'm praying that the train would hurry up to the next stop so that we could get off. I know that my sister is thinking the same thing. The other girl is looking at us and she looks uncomfortable too. He smiles and then seems to get excited, if you know what I mean. He then says to us, Oh, you guys are sisters, huh? In an incredibly perverted tone. He then licks his lips and keeps looking from my sister to me back and forth. At this point, the girl gives us an awkward smile and she looks just as terrified as we do. I can tell that this man is getting really excited by the fact that we said that we were sisters and comments about how beautiful we are. My sister looks at me and we see a stop coming up. We both know that it's not our stop, but at this point, we were just leaving the train. He keeps trying to talk to us and... We keep ignoring him, and as soon as the doors open, we leave. Again, I've been in many weird and uncomfortable situations, but the fact that he was literally so close to us with his perverted smile, his excited eyes, and, well, excited you-know-what, yeah, I'm glad that we were able to get away from him safely, and thankfully, he didn't follow us. So I shared a story with you guys a little while back. One of them was about a deer person or something out there where my grandmother lives. I don't live there anymore and I live 45 minutes away from her, but yeah, that was me. Anyways, I took out my dog tonight. My dog was peeing and I was on my phone, but we live in an apartment complex with thick woods in the back. My dog started growling, which is weird because, well, he never does. That's when I looked over and he was, and I'm honestly shaking thinking about it, but with my physical eyes, I see this six and a half or seven foot deer thing again. But first thought was it was a wendigo. I mean, it was thin and skinny with very wet fur, the deer skull and all that. It didn't seem to have eyes from where I was standing, but I could tell that it was staring right at us. It didn't move, didn't even make a sound. At that, I began to pull my dog back, and I looked back because I stepped on a stick, and when I did, it moved to the other side of the tree. I kind of yelled instinctively, you can't follow or harm me, go back. 
It didn't move and I dragged my dog into the house and quickly shut the door. My wife asked why I slammed the door so hard and I just told her that the dog was being weird. She just doesn't believe in that stuff. Anyway, I went back out a few minutes ago which was about an hour after it happened and there was no sign of it. I'm really shaken up by this because quite honestly after I moved I thought that this was all over. So this happened when I was 15 and my little sister was 12. A little bit of backstory here too. We lived in this small town for several years and it was a pretty safe place. A few years into living there we had a cop with his wife and kids move in two houses down from us. Our house was built sometime in the 1920s and a few nights before this incident our other siblings locked us out of the back door. Us being idiots we kicked the back door in. The door didn't budge but the frame came out of the wall and the door was just sort of hanging there. One of our blinds was broken, we didn't have the money to fix it. Seeing as my parents had eight kids and money was tight growing up, there was just no way. Anyways, the blinds were broken behind our TV. On the other side of the window was a garage and our driveway. Next to the driveway on our neighbor's property which was abandoned and had tall shrubs. But what we didn't know though was that there were two people hiding in the shrubs watching us. I'm going to try and leave some details out just to make a, a really long story short, but my little sister's name, her name is Candace, and my name is Aria. It was the summer of 2009. My oldest brother and his girlfriend were a mile from our house fishing, about 10 at night. All of our siblings and parents were asleep. Besides my oldest brother out with his girlfriend fishing, I was sitting in front of the TV watching it. Candace was sitting on the bed watching TV with me too, when all of a sudden Candace and I heard a very loud crash, a noise from the back door. We both screamed. We got up, ran to the phone and called our brother's cell phone. He said that he was on his way because his girlfriend apparently twisted her ankle anyway. He gets home eventually and by this point we woke everyone up in the house and had all the lights on. My brother tells us to stay in the house. My brother is six foot four and 300 pounds. Unknown to my family though, I slipped outside to check with my brother. I know it was stupid of me to do this, but I was a curious kid. I saw my brother being really quiet. He ran back to our fenced in backyard. He gets within arm's reach of this guy and he steps on a stick. The guy turns and looks back at my brother and takes off running and hops the fence and he got away sadly. I didn't see this because I went into the house after a while, but this is what my brother said. My brother comes in. He tells everyone that he saw a guy all in black and he was about six foot. This is all that he saw apparently and the rest of the night was pretty calm, but my brother was definitely on high alert. Now, the next night, my brother was out with his girlfriend, wherever they were at that time. It was again about 10 at night. Candace and I are watching TV again in the same spot as last time and again we hear a loud crash coming from the back door. But we screamed again and called our brother's cell phone. He came home again, the whole house was awake again and all the lights were on as well. My brother goes out and checks it out. This time he didn't see anyone out there. Oh and uh, I forgot to mention too that both of these times we looked at the back door both times the back door looked like it was kicked in really hard. This time, around the frame was out of the wall more, and the door was leaning further into the house as well. We didn't make a police report because we had a cop that lived like two houses down from us, and while he was at work, us kids would help take care of his pregnant wife, bring her over food, play with her kids. We didn't really see him much. And when we did, he was so sweet and nice, but... Anyway, we told the police officer what had happened and he told us that he thinks that there are two guys, that they've been stalking our house and watching us. The cop comes over and checks and looks. He said, I believe that there are two guys. One keeps lookout while the other one does the possible break-in apparently. He said that they've probably been looking through our broken blinds. He also said at night they could look in and you couldn't see anything if you look out. And after those two nights... Thankfully, there was no attempt to break in anymore. But fast forward to the fall of that year, and our cop neighbor, he comes over one day and told us something. He said, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but 
We caught a peeping Tom. He's in jail now, about 20 or so miles away, and he said that after the peeping Tom got caught, everything around this neighborhood apparently stopped. That the town was safe again because it seemed to be this guy. Candace and I were obviously freaked out and scared, and to this day her and I have to have all of our doors and windows locked. In fact, we check multiple times a day. If any of our curtains are open, we sort of get a bit scared, so we close the curtains every time. Honestly, I'm pretty afraid that it'll happen again. Thankfully, we no longer live in that town, but that thought is still very much ever-present. To this day, we don't know what their intentions were. We don't know if it was one or two guys, but I think that if he had gotten in, that honestly, we wouldn't be here today, and that is a very scary thought. I've had many, many experiences with the paranormal and interactions in my home, and I thought that I would share some here for all of you guys. So my wife is a childhood diabetic, and sometimes at night her sugar levels will drop dangerously, which can put her into a coma. I'm a very light sleeper and have trouble sleeping in general, so one night at about 2am I got up to go and watch TV. And as I walked past my wife, I looked at her and noticed two orbs above her head. One was bright yellow, and the other one was sort of a whitish, yellowish color. I looked, took a couple of more steps, and then went, what the heck? I backed up, and sure enough, the orbs were still above her head, so I went to check on my wife, and sure enough, she was profusely sweating, a sign of low sugar. We figure to this day that those orbs, they may have been her parents or something, and they were trying to tell us that something was wrong. On another night, I came back to bed and noticed an orb on my bed. I sat down on my bed and moved the blankets around, lifting them up and stuff to see if it was a light trick, but the orb just stayed there. I moved around, waved my hands, but the light was never blocked. But then, I heard a thump on the floor... I noticed that the orb was now at the base of our dresser and about shoulder height of our dear cat, Winston, who passed in 2007. Still miss him a lot, by the way. We have often felt him jump on the bed or jump off like that too, but this seemed to be something else. Again, I was up watching hockey at about 4am when I noticed a black triangle zip across the screen against the white ice. Hey, there's a bird in the stadium, I thought, so... I rewound the game, it was PVR, but there was no bird. Now, this isn't all that odd, I admit, but the next night, I just climbed into bed when I felt two tugs on my blanket, right by my shoulder. I ignored them and I went back to sleep, but the next night, as I was laying in bed, I swear that I felt a heavy weight sit on the edge of the bed beside me, and that absolutely terrified me. After that, whatever it was didn't return, but my wife has a friend who can interact with spirits, and she apparently said that it was someone named Kevin. Now, this next one I absolutely hate. So I have a fan that has a safety feature, and if you touch the fan shroud, it will stop the fan so kids can't be hurt. But suddenly, every night for months, at 3am-ish, the fan would stop, and when it stops... It makes a sort of loud electrical sound, a buzzing sound. The fan never stops at any other time except then, and I always felt that there was someone standing in that corner watching me each night, and this freaked me out, so I moved the fan to an empty room, and guess what? It didn't stop. If it did stop at random times, it was on from like 10pm to 9am, I would definitely say electrical problem, but... Every night at around 3 a.m., pretty much bang on, it would always stop, which was a bit strange. Now, the reason for sharing all of the above is that this next one happened just two nights ago. I was awake laying in bed and I could hear someone walking back and forth at the foot of the bed and it was keeping me awake. Then, I heard a tapping sound from our baseboard heater, then walking, then tapping, and... Well, this was too much, so I growled, Will you get lost? You're keeping me awake. 
And right after I said this, there was a loud thump on the floor like I startled it, and the air in the room became really much lighter, I guess you could say. I have more experiences, but these are probably the best ones. I guess I'm a bit tuned into spirits or whatever, but for the third one, I think I brought it on myself. Knowing that I'm a bit sensitive to all this stuff, I've been saying in my mind, if any spirit needs help and you are a good spirit, I'll try to help you. And I guess Kevin needed help, and perhaps that's why he approached. But whatever the case, it was still very terrifying, and quite honestly, I didn't really expect it, I guess. But here's hoping that after this last one, things will start to calm down. In about 1999, I finally saved up enough money to put a down payment on my own fixer-upper. It hadn't been lived in for quite a while, and it actually had been used by a local church as a youth facility. It was about 100 years old on the deed. It was located in a mill village in the Carolinas, and it was only four rooms and a bathroom at about 800 square feet. It was on one of the bigger lots in town. Now, I was recently divorced and living with a friend who I had worked with at one time who was also ex-military, so it worked out well moving into a house. He worked in law enforcement now and wasn't there much, but paid half of everything, which gave me some extra money for improvements. We had really nice neighbors, all retired, and I had many talks over the fence with them. As you can imagine though, two single guys living in one place, we had many women in and out of our doors. My elderly neighbor was a retired textile worker who was single most of her life and understood our habits. As I demolished the kitchen, I tore out everything down to the bare walls and replaced plaster with drywall. As it was slow going, considering that I was going to school and working both full time, there wasn't a lot of time for the remodeling. We did have one big table in the kitchen that we used for, well, pretty much everything. And one day, I came in from class and took my books out of my backpack and separated them by class in order to go through them quicker. I made a sandwich and joined with my roommate and his girlfriend in the next room just to catch up with the day. I just sat down when I heard all of my school books hit the floor in the kitchen. My roommate was the first to jump up with a weapon in hand because he thought someone was trying to break in. As we looked in the kitchen, not one item was on the table though. I picked everything up and put it in my backpack. I've always believed that spirits were possible, but after seeing this, I definitely had more to believe in, I guess. Puzzled that no door was open and that this happened, we just sort of joked about it and said ghost. The next day, I asked my neighbor next door if anyone had ever died in my house. She dropped her head for a minute and she said yes, two people in fact, a husband and wife who lived there for many years. That's not one of the first things you ask when you find a good deal in a house, I guess, and it was a lesson learned, but she said that the husband died first of natural causes, but the wife apparently had schizophrenia and lived many years after him. I also asked my neighbor if she had seen anything odd, and she said yes. She said that she had seen lights going on and off occasionally. I then said I sort of meant like, have you ever looked over at my house, and she chuckled and said no. Different things happened after that too, like we would come in and TVs would be on when we know that we turn them off. Lights the same way. I said something to my neighbor again and she said let me come over and talk to her. We had been friends before her health got bad. So my neighbor walked in and started talking to her as if she was standing right there and told her that we were good guys and we were going to take care of the house and we had to learn to live together. And amazingly enough, after that, there was really nothing else for quite a while. Now, I had finished the kitchen and started on the bathroom remodel at this point. At about the same time my roommate was making plans to move out, and a girl I was dating was moving in, we were planning to get married soon. She had a son, and I had to prepare a room for him with a big closet for his stuff. And it was at this point that things started happening again with the lights and TV and stuff falling off the kitchen counter again. My roommate said that he had lost his key to his room, swearing that it was on the keychain, but I dismissed it because I was going to replace it anyway. Later, when pulling up carpet for the new walk-in closet in my stepson's room, I found my ex-roommate's key. Believe it or not, 
under the carpet that I had pulled up. And honestly, I have no idea how that could happen. I had replaced that lock when my ex-roommate moved in and I checked and the key matched the lock. That was unbelievably odd. In the time that I was fixing up her son's room and the time that she was to move her stuff in, one afternoon I came home from school and drank a couple of beers and took a nap, only to wake up abruptly to my stereo blasting so loud that it was deafening. Mind you, this was one of those old school stereos that you adjusted volume by the knob and not a remote. I jumped up and turned it off. I rate, I remember saying something to the effect that this was my house and if we both can't live here, I'll burn it down. I think I even said that if there was a light near where she was that she needed to go to it. And after that, there was absolutely nothing for the next six years that my new wife and stepson ever experienced. Thinking back, maybe negative energy had been building up in the home for some time. Because some decisions were made for her son to go into a private school near where his father lived for a better education. And even though I didn't agree, she did it for his future and I understood. But our relationship paid for it in the end with divorce after eight years. Nothing I can remember stands out after my wife left other than that she said that in the end that the house gave her bad vibes and she wanted nothing to do with it. I had wondered at one point if the spirit of the woman wanted me to be there but wanted only me because there had absolutely been nothing else that had happened the entire time that I lived there alone. A few things did happen though by surprise during the sale of the home when I was preparing to sell. Like the furnace needed repairs and my entire front seal collapsed right before the home inspection due to termite erosion. That happened years before I bought it mind you but there were a small string of events like this of just unfortunate luck I guess. On a side note, it was odd how other information had come to me about the residents of my home prior to me living there through a woman I had dated when I first moved in. She had lived a few miles away and when I told her about what had happened with the books and the table, a neighbor of hers was nearby and overheard our conversation and asked where I lived. I told him and he said that he grew up over that way and they used to play ball in the church parking lot near there and that the woman who lived there when he was a boy had a lot of mental issues. If they hit a ball into her yard, she would grab it and take it in her house and throw it in her wood stove and burn it apparently. And that wood stove, when I moved in, it was the one in the kitchen. The one that I had trouble with as I was trying to sell it. So my name is Mark. I'm in my early 20s and I've always been fascinated by paranormal stuff, but I've never really been a believer, I guess you could say. It was sort of like an atheist studying a Bible type of situation, I guess. But I did actually happen to personally experience some weird stuff in my life and I do believe that my room was haunted on two occasions, maybe. So the first time was when I was 11 and my sister was 9. But when my family was slowly moving to a new house and renovating it, a set of white walls, no furniture... Me and my sister, on many occasions, were allowed to explore our new neighborhood. Once when we got back from our exploring trips, we just sat in our empty room and threw ball to each other singing some random nursery rhymes. When we were just going at it for something over half an hour when suddenly a ball stopped midway to my sister and went back to my hand. I was freaking, she was too, and we refused to visit for a while after that. Small clarification too, it was like this little heavier dog chewing ball and all the windows were closed, so no wind and since the room was empty, there was no bouncing from something else. It was as if the ball just defied physics or something. As an adult, I actually spoke about it to my mum, suspecting that it may have just been a false memory or something, but she actually confirmed that me and my sister once really lost our heads over something like that and even refused to sleep in our rooms for over a week and it had made her really tired. Now, the next haunting, if you can call it that, happened four years later. This time I wasn't present, but it happened in the same room apparently and I need to explain a bit about our room situation. 
So I shared my room with my younger brother, 10 year old at the time of this haunting or whatever. And my sister, she had her room next door. So I and my brother went to my cousin's place to have a sleepover. Since our room was bigger and we had a bigger TV and DVD player, my sister decided that she wants to sleep in there. So she goes there, watches a few movies and goes back to sleep. In the middle of the night, my fitness or stationary bike starts running, literally like someone was just using it. It was electric, but all the electronics were long overcooked and damaged. Besides those were trackers and they were incapable of moving the bike like it was at this point. So my sister started screaming and she went to our parents' room. When we got back, she was absolutely terrified and I actually needed to move to her room for a while since she refused to sleep alone at all. This story was also confirmed by our mother. Also, I remember sleeping in her room on my noble exile. There were no pets at that time in the house and honestly, it was just nothing that should have caused this. Also, my sister still swears by it and she really isn't someone to make something like this up. This story is something that I think about from time to time and it really creeps me out. I'm sharing this to get it off my chest because I think it's finally time to share it. So two, almost three years ago, I was 17 years old and at this point I was accustomed to being in horrible situations as all I had was my mother and she could not hold down a job for long because she had her own issues to tackle and so as I grew up we stayed in and out of roommates houses. We never really had a place of our own to stay except twice I guess but that didn't last long either and we would be forced into a new environment with a snap of a finger. So when I was 17 we were led into a situation where we were going to be homeless again and I was used to it at this point as I had slept in the street more than I'd like to say but the day comes when we have to leave our roommate's house and my mum is able to stay at her boyfriend's trailer. I had nowhere to go as I had no friends at this point as I halted my friendships because they were bad for my health and mental state and overall were pretty toxic. My mum offered me to go with her but I didn't want to as I felt like getting between my mum and her boyfriend was kind of weird. Plus, I'm used to the street and I didn't think it was that bad at that time. So, here we are. I get dropped off at a McDonald's and I eat some burgers before I go off into the streets once more. Eventually, the sun flared and darkness was all that remained and so I looked for a place to sleep for the night. I went into many places that night trying to sleep but none of them were working because it was either too hot or the lights were too bright or the mosquitoes were biting me. That's when I remember a house that I used to go into to chill in. This house was under construction and nearly finished so the doors all shut and the windows were all settled so there were no mosquitoes. I go through the back like always and I make my way upstairs. Eventually I settle into the bathroom because there's less debris on the floor. So I lay there and I try to sleep. Eventually I hear some sounds downstairs but I didn't think too much of it. I figured it was the door that I came through swinging open and closed or something. Eventually after laying there for maybe an hour I would guess, I open my phone and I look at some old photos of my life thinking about how messed up it was that I got to this point and how I lost everything. The noises were still happening this entire time, but I paid no mind to it. Eventually, for whatever reason, I get up and I go and sit down on the back porch because I just couldn't sleep. I make my way downstairs and out the back door to the porch. I'm messing around on my phone for maybe five minutes when it happens. I see movement to my left from the back door that I just exited from. I glance over and time itself just freezes. At first I think it's an illusion but I was in fact wrong. I see a man shrouded in darkness peering past the wall inside to gaze at me. His lower self of his figure was behind the wall entirely and I could not see anything but his upper body at this point. Almost like the man was trying not to let me see his full body as it would make his presence known. 
The man was a pure black silhouette and I couldn't make out any features at this point. After noticing him, I just sort of sat there and stared at him for what seemed like forever, but it was probably a minute or two. I expected him to come outside and talk to me because I normally talk to a lot of homeless people and I thought the man was just homeless. He didn't come outside though. In fact, he hadn't moved at all. He was weirdly as still as a statue. He was very quiet too. Maybe if I hadn't have noticed him, he would have stared at me the entire time. I eventually, after staring at him for some time, got up and got on my bicycle and made my way out of the property. As I'm walking out of the backyard, I peer into the window that is next to the door that I saw the man in. The moonlight revealed the man was still there, only now he was watching me walk out of the property. I could tell as well because the moonlight revealed the top of the man's head and I saw his left eye gazing at me. He was a white male who was quite tall and had a jacket of some kind on. I couldn't make out many details because he was still cloaked in darkness. After seeing this, I just moved a little faster out of there. I got to the front of the house on the street and I looked inside to see if I could see him again, but I couldn't. I got on my bicycle and waved goodbye to the house because I figured the man was still watching me. Then I just rode away. For the rest of the night, I really couldn't sleep. I tried two different spots, but both were no luck. And this is pretty much where the story ends. I know I didn't have a, a crazy chase or a fight to the death or anything, but this actually happened and it was very eerie and weird. I don't know what the man was doing in there. I assume that he was just trying to sleep like I was, but I don't know. The way he was staring at me was very unnerving. It makes me wonder too just how long the man was in that house for and what would have happened if I actually fell asleep in that house? Would he have just stared at me while I was asleep, completely blinded to his presence? Or did he have other intentions? I guess I'll never really know, but these days I don't go into houses like that anymore at all after this experience. If anyone could provide some advice or information, it would be appreciated. Everyone that I've talked to about my experience doesn't really believe in the paranormal, so they've all just sort of brushed it off. I, a 25-year-old female, live alone in the suburbs of Atlanta. Last night at around 9.30pm, I took my dog outside in my backyard. For context, I have a large chain-linked fenced-in backyard that has taller grass or shrubbery close to the fence line. My backyard is both surrounded by other houses as well as a wooded area. At the time of this experience, the surrounding houses did not have their lights on, nor did it seem like any of my neighbors were actually outside. Anyway, at around 9.50pm, I think, I was standing close to the tall grass when I heard a quiet, hey, come from the fence line. It was dark in that area, so I assumed it was some kind of animal and... Since I didn't want to freak myself out, I tried my best to ignore it. Five seconds later, I heard the voice again. Hey. This time, I could tell, though, that it was a woman's voice. The voice then continued saying, Hey, come here. Come here. It distinctly sounded like a woman trying to get me to come over there, but my gut told me to go inside ASAP. I freaked out and ran inside. My dog, sadly unaware of what was going on, refused to follow me inside. Visibly shaking, I frantically called my boyfriend who rushed over to investigate the backyard. He, of course, found nothing and assured me that it was probably an animal. I've read a couple of stories about animals sounding like humans and I tried my best to come up with a logical solution, but I am positive that I heard a human voice calling me. The voice was so clearly human. During my time outside last night, I never heard footsteps or rustling in the woods or anything. 
to me, it feels like whatever was calling me must have been right outside of my fence line and was calling me over so that I would be close enough to get to. I'm not sure if I experienced a person or some kind of creature, but whatever it was, it felt so evil and I knew that I was in danger by being outside. I am absolutely terrified to go outside at night again, but I know that I can't avoid it. I have some lights around my backyard, but clearly not enough, so I plan on installing some around the fence perimeter. Has anyone ever experienced anything like this? Is there anything that I can do to prevent this from happening again? While I was living and studying in the capital of my country, I had a small rented basement of a 1917 built house next to a nightclub. I was preparing to go to sleep quite early since I had class at 8am the next day. Right before I fell asleep, I remembered that I forgot to lock the door, but since the city I lived in was generally quite safe, and the only way to get to the entrance of my place was past the front gate, all around to the other side of the house and down some stairs. I didn't think much of it and proceeded to fall asleep. Skip forward to the middle of the night. I wake up and feel someone or something slowly pulling my blanket off of me. In a confused state, I extend my hand and feel a hairy male arm under my fingers. My first thought was, oh, this is probably my drunk flatmate. But then I remembered that... He was at his girlfriend's place on the other side of town. In pitch black, I jump up from my bed, rush to the light switch, and I turn it on. And I find a stranger, around my age, student, standing in his underwear by my bed, with his underwear clearly wet. My initial reaction was to stay calm, since I had no idea if this dude was violent, or what was even going on in the first place. I calmly asked him, Man, what are you doing in here? He was clearly very confused as well and took a seat on a recliner that I had in my tiny room. And there we were, both in our underwear, him covered in himself after he wet himself, and I on the border of wetting myself, and what does he do? He extends his hand and introduces himself to me. At that point I go, Okay dude, get out of my house and start escorting him to the hallway where I find all of his clothes and shoes on the floor. As I'm escorting him out, he goes into the bathroom and locks himself inside. I hear him turn on the shower and proceed to knock on the door saying, Hey man, if you don't leave right now, I'm calling the cops. To which he replies, I'm not afraid of the police. Well, that's just perfect, isn't it? A few minutes pass and he steps out of the bathroom butt naked with my flatmate's towel around his waist, looks at me looking kind of content and says, Hey, did you see they've got a shower here? At that point, I am fuming. This is my house, I say. You're a total stranger and you just broke into my place. Suddenly, an expression of complete fear appears on his face. Oh, what have I done, he says. He says this as he's very awkwardly trying to get dressed in the hallway. Then I finally managed to get him out of the house. I even called one of his friends from my phone to come and pick him up at the club. Turns out he's from a completely other town and came to party to the capital, got kicked out of the club for starting a fight and somehow managed to get to my place. To this day I have no idea what he was on or how the heck he even managed to find my apartment as it was pretty hidden from the street. Which... I guess is the weird thing about this story. Anyway, going through something like this is terrifying. I know it's probably a little bit amusing for others to hear this story, but let's just say that I never forgot to lock the door from that day on. When I was little, I lived in an apartment and my dad was gone for two weeks on a business trip. I was home alone with my mum. I was never really scared easy as I've always been in love with investigating the paranormal, yet respecting it at the same time. If I go into a room and I don't feel welcome, I just don't stay. 
It just seems like common sense to me, but I kept having these nightmares, all from what I could tell, uh, the same night. I'd be sleeping in bed with my mum. I was pretty young at this point, and I woke up. Shortly after, though, a big clown would always pop in and see me awake. I would wake my mum up, and it would charge at us and slaughter us in the dream. The clown was emotionless with black and small eyes. I don't ever remember seeing a mouth, but I know that it had one. It was white and grey and severely overweight, at least 400 to 500 pounds. It was about the size of the door frame, so almost 6'8", and it never made any sound verbally or physically by walking. It cast a, a feeling of dread, yet at the same time I got the feeling that it just didn't want to be seen. I got the feeling that it was curious and observant of me and didn't want to be caught or known about. So, like I said, I had this dream and I was terrified to do anything by myself. But there was one more night before my dad was coming home and I was terrified that I'd be sleeping in my own bed again. We went to bed and eventually I fell asleep. But I woke up right after the same dream for like the 14th time in a row. Except this time, I had that feeling of dread still. Something in my gut told me that it was happening in real life now. I closed my eyes and pretended to go to sleep. I cracked them as far open as I could while still looking asleep and sort of positioned myself under my blanket perfectly to keep an eye on the door. I waited so long, but in the end nothing happened. I finally started to breathe normal and that was when something happened. The same exact clown from the same exact dream walked into the doorway. I looked at my mum, then looked at me. It sat there silently, I'd assume making sure that we were asleep, then just walked out. I never heard one ounce of sound from him, but I could hear the AC, I heard the front door open and close too. After that, I got up and I didn't go back to bed that night. But the weirdest thing was that the next day, my dad asked my mum why the front door was unlocked and she asked me if I unlocked it. She knew that I'd stayed up that night. In the end, I just said yes because I knew that if I told them the truth that I would sound crazy. So this has been happening for around three days now. It only ever happens when I'm in my bedroom or close to it just outside of my room in the hallway or something. Every few minutes, I'll hear a sort of high-pitched scream or crying. It's not loud, though. It's sort of on the same level as mumbling, I guess, or maybe whispering, but I can still make it out what it sounds like. It started about three days ago. I was playing on my PS4 with headphones on, and I kept hearing weird noises in my room. Sometimes it was a sort of screaming or yelling type noise, and sometimes it was sobbing. The sobbing noise is hard to describe. It's like when someone's crying so hard that they start choking, and they only last for about two seconds, or sometimes they're really quick and are only a split second. I thought that it was just background noises in the game at first, and I kept looking around for the source of the noise, but I found nothing. I thought it must have been my headphones making a weird noise because they're a little broken so I just ignored it at that time. But the next day I was lying in my bed watching YouTube at around 9pm when I started to hear the same noises again. This time I thought that it was my pet bird making the noise for some reason so I got up to check on her and she was sleeping. I've had birds in the past that sometimes make noises in their sleep but this one doesn't, so I knew that it wasn't her. So I went back to bed and carried on watching YouTube. A few minutes later, the noises started again. I tried to just ignore it and hope that it would go away, but it didn't. The noises went from happening every few minutes to about every 10 seconds. I actually started to get really scared at this point, and I sat up. But as soon as I did... The noises suddenly stopped. That cycle repeated for the rest of the night too until I went to sleep at around 11. 
I'd watch YouTube, hear noises, keep still, start moving, the noises suddenly stop, and repeat all over again. The same thing has been happening to me today as well, except the noises are not as frequent. I have no idea what's causing this, and honestly it's getting more annoying than frightening at this point. Although, it really does sound like someone's screaming and crying. I really don't know what to do, and if you've got any ideas as to how to figure this one out, then please do let me know. I feel like I've looked everywhere, and I just cannot understand where this noise is coming from. So this is not my story, but my dad's. He grew up with a single mom and four other siblings in southeast Texas, on the border of Louisiana, in the bad part of town. The house that this happened in was behind a nightclub. He was born in 1967 and says that this happened when he was two, and he still remembers it. He says him and his brother, who was maybe six at that time, were sleeping on the couch in their living room and... They both woke up to a black-eyed child standing in the doorway of their closet. He said that the child looked older than them by a little, had black eyes and orange hair, and had a slight sort of glow to him, like he was under his own spotlight almost. He said that him and his brother tried to scream, but nothing would come out. Then the child just suddenly disappeared before their eyes. And the reason that everybody knows that this is true is that a couple of months ago, me and my mom and my dad, we were at my grandma's house and my uncle was watching a documentary on black-eyed children when my dad brought up what happened to them all those years ago. And my uncle started tearing up a bit and just kept repeating, Man, you seen that too? I thought that I was crazy. I can't believe that you saw him too. My uncle has a history of drug usage and mental health problems, and all of these years, for over 50 years, he assumed that what he had seen was fake, and just his mind playing tricks on him. It's sad too, because we think that this situation shook him up so badly as a kid that it might have been the cause of his use of drugs as a teen, to cope with the thought that he may have been going crazy. They were so scared that they just never brought it up ever again after that, but my dad always told my mom that story ever since they started dating. My grandma, who was sitting there listening to them talk about what happened, just said, Oh, there was something in that house, Lord. And after hearing that, I'm going to try and get her to tell me about her experiences in that same house. So my wife and I moved into her grandma's old house maybe three years ago now. My wife always told me that her grandma would tell her the closet and the bathroom in the master bedroom were haunted. Grandma never really shared details. I always thought that these kinds of stories were dumb so I just didn't ask questions. And the house was normal and still is, I think. But fast forward to last month. We now have two children. One is a two-year-old girl and one is a three-month-old newborn. My two-year-old is very ahead in preschool as far as talking and full sentences and anything cognitive. My two-year-old is very ahead in preschool as far as talking and full sentences and anything cognitive. When we had our newborn, the two-year-old wanted back in our room because, well, she felt left out. I know, go ahead and judge the parenting. But about two months ago, my two-year-old was at my parents' house for a sleepover. My daughter has a tablet that I let her use on airplanes or long travel to watch kids' videos and whatnot. The phone hadn't been used in some time and was in this closet. I have YouTube Premium, which will play videos without the screen being activated. The phone started playing loud, rain, rain, go away music. We opened up the phone and YouTube said, video unavailable. We have video footage of this, by the way. If someone needs footage, I can probably share it, but... A couple of weeks later, I still think my wife is full of it. We go to the park with our two-year-old. She's swinging, there's no wind. All the swings around her aren't moving an inch from the wind, which they should since they would actually attract more air resistance. 
but two swings at the end are fully swinging like kids are on them. It was weird, and I also have some footage of that too. Anyway, I work night shifts this month, so I don't get home until two in the morning. At two weeks, my daughter has been lying in bed with my wife and will go point to the ceiling saying, Mean cloud, go away, black cloud, go. At the time, my wife just shrugged it off and assured her everything is okay and she would go back to sleep. But the last week, things have gotten worse. My daughter will say the same things but cover her ears and try hiding in my wife's chest to get away and start screaming as loud as she can. And my wife talked to her grandma who used to live here and she came over three days ago. My wife recorded her privately for audio in her pocket at this point, we think, what the heck is going on? But my wife asked her grandma without the two-year-old around about how the house was haunted. And grandma said, oh, honey, and walked to the bedroom and shut the closet and the bathroom door. They returned to the living room and grandma said, sorry, can't let them listen. Grandma started with saying, oh, you think you'd scare me? Referencing whatever was going on. Grandma stated that, she would tell the black cloud, oh, you think you're funny? It was some sort of cloud, so it kept swooping at me. Finally, I just said, well, you're wasting your time. I'm not scared of you. To be noted, too, is that Grandma now has dementia and stated that she now thinks this might have been a dream. This is also on video. Personally, I feel ridiculous even sharing this because I don't believe in paranormal activity at all. But tonight, I was working and my wife called me in tears as she woke up to my two-year-old hunched over yelling no, no and tried to grab her to calm her down. My daughter climbed under the bed and started banging her head off the ground and busted her lip causing it to bleed. I came home as fast as I could and my daughter's mouth was slightly bleeding. She was shaking. Like I said, it's more than likely night terrors and a weird sequence of events now that my wife is more paranoid, i.e. lights being on that we never use, clocks dying more than normal, daily in fact, the swings at the park swinging next to my daughter with no wind, on video like I said. I really don't know what to think about any of this now, and if you have any advice then I would love to hear it. I'm more than likely going to take her to the doctor to make sure that she isn't sick or vitamin deficient or something like that. I want my wife and kid at ease and I just want this to be over and done with. About 19 years ago near my hometown in country New South Wales, I used to get driven to catch a bus from a town called Parks, about one and a half hours from my hometown, to go and visit my then boyfriend in another town several hours away. The bus that I had to travel to get to left from Parks at around two in the morning and it arrived back late at night and my dad would always pick me up. And on two separate occasions, we saw something strange. On the first occasion, we were driving along the country road in between two towns. The road ran in between fenced off farms. There were hills behind these farms that were sort of silhouetted against the often bright night sky and we saw a big ball of light traveling down the hill parallel to our car, probably a couple of kilometers away, and we thought that it was just a truck at first, possibly driving along there, until we both realized that there wasn't actually a road there, and it was one light, not two. Like car headlights have two headlights, right? And it definitely wasn't a motorcycle, just because there wasn't a road there didn't necessarily mean that it wasn't a vehicle though, but it moved so smoothly and quickly and we just thought that it was really weird, I guess. We didn't really think too much about it until a few weeks later when we were doing the same drive late at night, possibly a bit after midnight, and we saw the same light in the same area moving quickly and smoothly again. This time, Dad decided to stop the car and turn off the engine, and when he did that, the light came down the hill and it was hurtling towards us across the farm fields and over the fence that divided the farms from the road, 
And man, it was fast. The ball of light was probably about two meters off the ground and had a diameter of around one and a half meters, I would say. It was huge, silent, a ball of light that kind of fluctuated and rotated as it moved. It slowed and covered in the middle of the road behind our car, probably about 50 meters from behind us. Eventually, though, it slowed and hovered in the middle of the road behind our car, probably about 50 meters behind us. I was terrified, but Dad was fascinated, watching it inquisitively. I was panicking and yelling to start the car and drive. I'm not sure what happened after that because Dad turned the engine on and we just started driving. We never saw that light again, but that was the most bizarre thing that I've ever seen. And every now and again, I mention it to my dad, just so that I know that I'm not going crazy and dad always confirms every detail of it with me. I'm glad we were both there because otherwise I would probably think that I was going mad. I hadn't heard of Min Min lights until years later. The things that people have described as Min Min lights match exactly what we saw. I'll never forget it and I'm wondering if anyone else has ever seen something like this in country New South Wales. I've read lots of stories of these sorts of lights in Queensland, but not New South Wales. I used to hang out with my cousin a lot. We were both 10 and male at the time of this encounter, and I'm now 33. It has always stayed with me too, ever since then. We'd mostly spent our youth roaming the streets as young kids, not causing trouble but kicking footballs around fields, climbing, hanging out with kids our age, the typical stuff before iPads and Netflix became commonplace. One day, we decided to go and explore a part of town that we'd never explored before. It meant going through alleyways and back streets, the trail would actually end approximately two to three minutes from my house, which was a safe part of the neighborhood. It was a sunny day, albeit not too warm, and my cousin and I had been walking for what seemed like miles. The journey we'd planned was supposed to go on for longer, but we got bored and decided to take our detour home. The detour involved cutting through an alleyway that looked a little bit like the Coronation Street Ginnel, if anyone is familiar with the TV show. To the left of us were terraced houses and to the right of us, steel fences with sharp points to deter any would-be thieves. We continued up there and soon enough, one of the kids from our school lived there and his mum shouted, what are you boys doing here? We ran. I don't know why. We just didn't like her son and her tone was accusatory, I guess. As we ran, we bumped into another kid. Don't go that way, he said, as his voice trailed off as he ran farther and farther away from us, down the opposite end of the alleyway. We shrugged and continued on. It got darker with the streets and foliage, but we soon emerged from the alleyway, and that's when we saw the lone boy. A boy, aged maybe 10 to 12, stood there. His eyes were empty. He had a, a vacant look on his face. Well, the half of his face that we could see well enough. Above his mouth was covered with a, a veil, somewhat like a Halloween mask of some description, except it was June. Halloween was months away. As we got closer, we noticed that the boy had a kitchen knife in his hands. I mean, a fully real stainless steel kitchen knife, both hands on the handle. The sunlight made the blade glisten. We cracked a joke cooking outside but he looked at us blankly no emotion nothing we were too freaked out to move now and that's when we realized that he hadn't moved either not a muscle we saw him blink but physically the knife hadn't been raised up or pointed at us just held closely to his chest blade pointing upwards we figured that we should get away because Instinct told us that this was weird and a bit freaky. Going back down the alleyway didn't seem like a safe option. Being stuck in the alley with a strange kid with a knife didn't seem smart either. In front of us was a road on a steep hill. It was our best bet. We walked up to the top of the hill, keeping an eye on this kid. 
The top of the hill was maybe two to three minutes from my house in terms of distance, and at last we felt safe. As we looked back down the hill, the lone kid had put the knife by his leg, now holding it in one hand, but remained in the exact same spot, and stared right back up at us, expressionless. When we got home, we told our parents what had happened, and they called a local community enforcement team to scout the area. And apparently, the kid was found with the knife, but we never heard why he was there or what he was doing. 23 years after it happened, and it's still on my mind a lot. So my very first experience happened when I was about three to four years old. I used to live in this cute little house in a very close-knit community or neighborhood up in Massachusetts. It was a modest house with an upstairs, ground floor, and cellar areas. Immediately upon walking through the front door, the living room was to your right, the kitchen to your left, and a staircase was directly to your front. At the top of the stairs, there were two rooms to the left and right, which was my room on the right and my parents' room to the left. Now, I don't remember much about my parents' room, but mine felt humongous as a kid. There were a lot of interesting things about my room too, but one of the most interesting things about it was the closet. I was unaware of it, but there was a door at the top of my closet that went up into the attic-themed sort of bedroom above mine. The closet was very small, a typical one with a light bulb and a dangle string to turn it on and off, and a rod to hang clothes. Needless to say, the door was definitely oddly placed. My parents never used it, which is even more odd in retrospect, but anyway. My first experience, as you could probably guess, happened in my bedroom. I kept some of my toys in my closet, and I had pulled them out at one point. It was a blue rectangular Lego bucket filled with miscellaneous toys and doohickeys, and of course Legos. I had also pulled out some pieces of paper, Play-Doh, and colored pencils at one point. I was going ham with every toy and entertaining item that I had. And well, my dad had been in the habit of drawing cubes at the time, and that had confounded my childhood brain. I kept thinking, how in the world is he putting the pencil into the paper to draw the back part of the cube like that? So just imagine a, a little booger-nosed child sitting in front of an open closet with all his toys, Legos, and snakes made out of Play-Doh, stabbing a piece of paper with a colored pencil, trying to draw the back of a cube. When all of a sudden, I was distracted by a noise in the closet, and upon looking up, noticed the little dangle switch for the light bulb was swaying back and forth. I thought absolutely nothing of it, and continued stabbing my paper, a couple of moments later, another noise came from the closet, but this time the dangle was flailing back and forth like crazy. I thought to myself, huh, adult stuff that I don't understand, whatever, and continued on. I apparently was able to ignore that. Child me just didn't give a hoot, without giving it a second thought, and then the noise changed. I looked up again to see the string completely motionless and it proceeded to pull down over and over again, turning the light on and off. Then the door literally closed by itself. Huh, never seen that before. Must be adult stuff. Whatever, I thought. This is one of those experiences that I guess gave me extra goosebumps later on because I only realized it in hindsight that that was not supposed to happen. Now, the other experience I had in this room was around the same time frame, except that it was pretty much every night. I'm willing to concede that perhaps this is my childhood mind going wild before bedtime, and it could have been a persistent nightly hallucination, I guess. It's doubtful based on what I remember, but still, it's possible. Now, my bed was in the far corner of my room from the bedroom door, and next to my bedroom door there was a window. I laid in my bed facing this window every night, and it was what I usually focused on as I fell asleep. The interesting thing that would happen though was that a pale blue light would be in my window every night. It wasn't this sort of brazingly bright tangible light or anything, mind you. 
I didn't just have Casper floating in my window is what I'm getting at. It was more accurately described as a sort of mist, I guess. It was like it was there, but also it sort of wasn't. Almost like when you're in the dark and you look at something long enough that it starts to change, but it obviously isn't changing. Hard to articulate, but regardless, when I looked at the light, it became whatever I would think about it. At the time, I loved Iron Giant movies, so that is what I constantly imagined. It would be the Iron Giant in the distance, but transparent and bluish, walking toward my house, but never getting any closer. I'd watched this until I fell asleep for months, and I don't really recollect when it stopped, but it never seemed scary to me. Weird, right? Anyway... My parents had their own experiences in the house too, so there was definitely something going on. I might go over those as well at some point, but I want to focus on what I saw or heard directly with my own two eyes and ears. So fast forward roughly 10 years and I'm about 13 to 14 years old. I had moved to Virginia in this time, but I had to move back to Massachusetts to visit my grandmother with my family for a holiday. She lived in an apartment complex and her apartment was very cozy and decently sized. I had visited this place many times as a kid because my parents needed a break from me and dropped me off to my grandma's. And I had never really experienced anything weird, I guess you could say, even in hindsight. Needless to say then, when they asked me to take the couch in the living room at night, I really thought nothing of it and I obliged. So there I was, in the pitch black darkness, laying on the couch at one or two in the morning in my grandmother's apartment. I had my Game Boy with my Pokemon Emerald game inserted, and for those of you familiar with Pokemon, specifically Ruby, Sapphire and Emerald, there is a Pokemon named Zigzagoon with the ability Pick Up that allows them to be holding random goodies after a battle sometimes. You could get gold nuggets and rare candies in the beginning of the game in Ruby and Sapphire by using this method to farm them, but they had apparently nerfed this method in Emerald and made the loot level based. So picture me on the couch slowly figuring this out on my own and becoming increasingly annoyed at Pokemon. It sort of randomly dawned on me that I was in the pitch black darkness. I wasn't scared of the dark, but this thought came to me in a way that I can only describe as artificially I guess. I normally wouldn't have cared and I was definitely more focused with farming resources in Pokemon. But immediately upon having this realization, I suddenly heard something on the ceiling. It was almost muffled but it sounded like a, a man constantly mumbling without a pause. I sort of perked up and looked up at the ceiling like, what is that? Bear in mind, it sounded like it was in the room with me, not a neighbor above or anything. The sound began to get louder and the words became more discernible. They were my thoughts. Freaked out, I casually got under the covers while assuring myself that I wasn't actually scared. I'm just cold and I'm getting comfy, is what I told myself. Now, when I say that they were my thoughts, what I mean is that whatever I thought... This thing, or whatever it was, would recite it. It was sort of like a mumbled whisper, but if I thought the word dog, it would start saying dog over and over and over again. If I thought any word, it would say it. Under the blankets, I turn the volume on my Pokemon game to max, and I press it against my face and fly my character to the battle frontier for the loudest music in the game. But it didn't help. As a matter of fact... The voice descended down slowly from the ceiling while it also became louder. When it got to the point where I definitely couldn't ignore it anymore, I just listened and I grasped how it worked. My teenage mind immediately decided, haha, I can make it say the F word and other expletives. So that's exactly what I did. I made it say the most outrageous stuff that I could think of. And for about 30 seconds, that was hilarious. But then, then it wasn't. It was right next to my head, and pretty much just as loud as a real man whispering next to me. The thing that really began to scare me was how relentless it was with its whispers. And as I got scared, 
my thoughts began to reflect that. As I said before, it recited my thoughts and I was thinking things like, what is that? What is that? It's right next to my head. These were the things that were being repeated back to me. That freaked me out into fight or flight mode and in the end I chose fight. I immediately flipped my blanket off of my head and launched a haymaker in the direction of the sound. It immediately stopped and when I looked around, there was nothing there. That was pretty much it for that situation and it was the last time that I ever experienced anything of that nature. I'm now 27 years old so I'm starting to become a bit more of a skeptic I guess you could say but it's just something that I'll never forget what I experienced that night and I have trouble shaking it off as just a hallucination. But I'm curious to hear as to what you guys have to say and any of your thoughts on these things. Have you had any similar experiences and what do you think that this all could have been? Let me start off by saying a couple of things. I'm autistic and I have a hard time narrowing down a story to a couple of lines, so this may be a bit longer than it needs to be. Me and my mum are both believers. We've had plenty of experience with the paranormal in the past, and I've been open to the paranormal since a young age. Whether that be shadow people, relatives that have passed on, come to visit us, possessions, you name it, we've probably had some sort of an experience with it. Now, I work as a delivery person. I deliver papers and ads in my city. I use a metal wagon cart to put the papers and stuff in so that I can take more with me on one trip. I pull this behind me. It's important to the story, I promise. I like to do this work in the evening though because I like how quiet it is and the fact that not many people are outside so I can do my work in peace and avoid talking to people. And this all happened in the span of 30 minutes. So the first thing that happened was a cold hand touched me on my right shoulder. It felt like a right hand. The hand was not icy cold but really as cold as a corpse if that makes sense. It didn't put a lot of pressure on me or anything. It was more as to like get my attention or whatever. Like say you're walking behind someone and you want their attention. I was pulling my car behind me so this simply wouldn't be possible for someone to touch my right shoulder with their right hand like that. I looked around in confusion, thinking to myself, okay, that's weird. I did not see anyone or anything around me. The nearest people near me were across the parking lot. The second paranormal thing happened maybe two minutes after on in the same street as the first encounter, just a little further away. I think that they may be related, but I'm not sure. There's a restaurant at the corner of the street in my town with automatic doors that you have to come closer to so that they open. You have to be within like one to two meters for the door to register a person. I was walking five meters away from the door and the door opened. I looked inside and didn't see anyone in the hallway. All I saw was the person at the register cleaning the counter. I walked past not really thinking anything of it. I left my cart at the corner of the street and crossed the street to deliver a few papers. I came back, grabbed another one for said restaurant, and went to put it in the mailbox. I turned to go and walk towards the mailbox and I see the door opening again from quite far away. This time I was a good 7 meters away from the sensor and behind a pillar that's in front of the restaurant so there's no way I could have triggered it. I walked around the pillar and felt something shoving or kicking my butt. It wasn't hard and it didn't hurt, but it was enough to make me stumble and force me to take another step. I looked around me and again, there was no one there. I thought maybe it was those people that I saw in the parking lot earlier, but they were quite far away by then. I wasn't scared as much as I was unnerved, I guess, that two things happened so close together like that. I called my mum right as that happened though and I told her what was going on. While on the phone with her I continued to walk my route and everything was fine. I moved into the next section without anything else happening and I hung up. Now the third thing happened in the next section of my route and it completely freaked me out. 
One of the streets I have to deliver on is a cul-de-sac type of street. It goes down a hill for a little bit, then it wraps around some other houses and comes out on the other side of them. There is a lamppost shining its light onto the street where the cul-de-sac begins. I enter the first part of the street that goes down and I put my cart down so that I could deliver some more houses. I was halfway down the street when I saw the train of a dress fly by around the corner where I just came from by the beginning of the cul-de-sac. I don't mean flying as the person was hovering off the ground. I mean flying in the sense of the person was running past and the train was following behind them. Think of a typical sort of scary movie where a ghost runs around the corner and you just catch a glimpse of them. It wasn't an actual person though because the light didn't get obstructed by them. I just saw that dress. In any case, I quickly finished the street, grabbed my cart and stood under a lamppost where I felt safe and I called my mum. She told me that she was on her way already since our last call and she said that I sounded really scared and freaked out and hearing me now I was almost hyperventilating. I told her that it wasn't necessary and I'd stay in the street lights and the parts that weren't lit well I would do them tomorrow during the day. She then came to me anyways and came with me as I finished the rest of my route. I was mostly done anyway so it wasn't too long. But when we came home we looked some things up about it and we tried a few things to protect me from whatever this was. And I'm wearing my crystal bracelets again and will not be taking them off for a week. I personally think that the first two incidences are related. Maybe the cold hand was trying to warn me for the push or kick that I would receive a little later. Or it was trying to get my attention with the hand and when I didn't respond, it gave me a shove to get my attention. For the third thing though, I just don't know. It really freaked me out. I am freaked out and still quite anxious about the whole thing too. For now, I will not be doing my work during the evening and I'll be doing it during the day. I do have a question though for all of you. Do you think that this is all related? Or were these just a few paranormal occurrences that just sort of happened in a span of 30 minutes and are unrelated? So I had this old townhouse that I lived in for a couple of years in Florida on Tyndall Air Force Base. Apparently there were old burial mounds discovered there, a true story as well, you can google it. While we, wife and I lived there, we experienced some stuff that we never really got answers for. These stories are completely true though. One night, we were sitting in the living room, which is connected to the kitchen, where our side entrance door was, roughly 10pm or so I would say, when all of a sudden, we hear our kitchen door slam shut, hard enough to shake the windows. After a few minutes of us both just sitting there, sort of collecting ourselves, we go and check the door. Now, not only was there no damage, the door was locked and deadbolted shut. There was no way someone could have opened it without breaking in. They certainly couldn't pick the lock or something and then lock it again after they panicked and slammed the door. But this was over a decade ago now and we still occasionally bring it up in disbelief that it actually happened. The second one I didn't experience myself but I was home when it happened. So I was again sitting in our living room playing some video games. Wife was in the bathroom down the hall. Our bedroom was directly across from the bathroom. Wife comes out to where I was with a really terrified look on her face. She said that she apparently saw me walk by the bathroom where she tried to get my attention, but I ignored her and walked into the bedroom. She followed me in there, but when she got there, there was nobody. And obviously I was still out playing games. She was understandably incredibly freaked out by this, but I swore to her that I had never moved from the couch. Now, this last story probably freaked me out the most and makes me think that maybe it was a, a poltergeist or something. You see, we're laying in bed about to go to sleep. It's pitch black in our room, can't see anything. And all of a sudden we start hearing scratching coming from the closet by the foot of the bed we both get quiet and listen. 
The sound starts getting closer, scratching on the walls now. Now it's softly rattling the blinds on the window next to my side of the bed. At this point, we're in full-blown nope mode and try to ignore it. I bury my face in the pillow and I try to go to sleep. A few minutes go by and then something lands on the back of my neck. I freak the heck out and I do a smash, grab and throw of whatever is on my neck and then run to the light switch. It was a cockroach, but it was literally the size of my palm. It could be a massive coincidence that it landed on essentially the only exposed piece of skin that I had between the covers and the pillow, but a part of me thinks that it might have been used to scare me considering the other stuff that we had dealt with. Plus, the absolute size of this thing was crazy. There were some other times as well that maybe I'll talk about some other time, but I'll leave it there for now. Feel free to ask any questions, but I genuinely don't know more beyond what I've already written. So my first job out of high school was a retirement home. My job was in the kitchen. It was my job to do a lot of the grunt work, I guess you could say. This is why I was hired. All the trash, food carts to the floors for the residents, bust the tables, etc. The old facility had four buildings and was built more than a century ago. The primary residence, the two dormitories, and a maintenance building for the workers. This facility, if memory serves me correct, was originally created to house tuberculosis patients. The maintenance building and the primary residence were the only ones with power. The dormitories had been shut down over the past decade or two. Tuberculosis was cured. Now, this next part I'm unsure of, but as the maintenance personnel are my source, I really had no reason not to believe them as it was logical. And what they said is that in time the dormitories were gutted. There was no electricity supplied to the buildings, not even a light bulb. Months would go by and not see anything or even think that I may have. But when I did, it would be something out of the corner of my eye that made you sort of do a double take. Hauling the garbage out at night, I could see a dark figure moving across window panes here and there and on another night somewhere else. Since it didn't repeat immediately, I just sort of dismissed it, I guess. Sometimes you think you see a resident on the grounds, only to do another take realizing that they aren't there. After being there for nearly a year, a weird thing started happening, though. The elevator next to the kitchen, a service elevator used by the employees, started moving on its own. It was a, a cranky, slow and loud beast. Not obsolete, but definitely the original one when it was built. It was my job to take the dining carts to the floors from the kitchen for the residents that had food brought to them. At first, it sort of started randomly too. I'd pull the cart up the elevator and the door would just open. Um, okay. It's really not supposed to do that unless you hit the button. In time, it would do more as well. Not all the time, it was sort of completely random really. I would still hit the floor I would be going to, not thinking paranormal. Someone must have just pressed the elevator button, calling it to their floor. It was one of these trips that my dull-witted mind noticed something, though. If someone called the elevator, and I went to the second floor with no interruption, and no one got into the elevator from the second floor, why didn't it go to the third or fourth floor before allowing me to return to the base floor, or one floor below floor one? It took some weeks before I got the opportunity to try what I was thinking and it happened. One night, taking a cart to the third floor, the elevator opened as I approached it. I pulled the cart in and decided not to hit a button. The doors closed and off the elevator went. Did someone summon the elevator? Lo and behold, the elevator got to the third floor. No one was there. I pushed the dining cart out. Returning to the elevator, the elevator started moving again and returned me to the base floor. Did that just really happen? No, that's impossible. In time, I got my chance to replicate this. Not long after that time, I just explained it happened exactly how the other one did. Except this time, the second floor. 
exactly the place that I needed to be and return me to the base floor. Over the next five months, it happened so often that I actually came to expect my lift man was going to ferry me up and down. I did thank him from time to time, whether I was making a delivery or returning to collect the dining cart, it just happened. Did he do it all the time? Well, no, but enough to expect it. And well, I messed up. I brought it up to a co-worker that the elevator was doing this. This apparently wasn't a good thing to do, divulging this was happening, because the lift man stopped lifting for me after this. I guess he didn't like his little secret being outed. It never happened again, like ever after this. One of the joyless jobs was taking the trash out, like I said earlier. A big bin across ice on an uneven sidewalk covered in more ice through the courtyard, all by yourself, is not a good time. It was right in the corner of my eye, though, a light come on in the dormitory, and I looked. And there was a shadow man hanging by the neck from the ceiling in one of the dorm rooms on the third floor. I saw him sway a little to the left and then to the right, and then suddenly the light went out again. I wasn't terribly frightened, I guess, but definitely had the heebie-jeebies crawl up my spine. I was in the what-the-heck-did-I-just-see category, but let's just say the emptying of the trash and getting back inside was definitely top priority after that. It was the first time that I saw a light come on, but it definitely wasn't the last. That room lit up on three separate occasions, in fact. The second time, there was nothing. The third was a, a shadow looking at the window, the kind of looking where the height from the bottom of the window still suggested that they were seated. I wasn't the only one to see the hanging man, too. A co-worker came in one evening, freaking out with tears, saying that they saw someone hanging in one of the rooms. I decided to keep my mouth shut. Over my time there, shadows in that dormitory, this was the dorm with the morgue that I learned later or was told later, would be seen more directly than the corner of your eye. I personally never saw anything in the dorm, but one of the maintenance men refused to go in there at all. They do sweeps to check the buildings for squatters, and I overheard him talking to a co-worker that he was never going in there again. I got off the elevator on the third floor with a dining cart once, I recall seeing an old and frail woman. She was easily in her 80s, sitting in a wheelchair in a hospital gown that had a sort of tiny floral print. As I turned left to push the cart about eight feet, I heard her speak. Excuse me, can you help me, she said. I stopped the cart and looked at her. Uh, yes, ma'am, what's up, I said. I need to get to my room. Can you get me in there, she replied. Uh, sure, I said. I walked to the back of the wheelchair and asked her where her room was and started pushing it forward. I recall the weight that I was pushing felt heavy on me for such a frail woman. I have the body memory of feeling the weight of the chair work against me, but I got through. I was just surprised, I guess. I was taking baby steps and was slow. I didn't want to jolt this woman in her chair. We went maybe four feet before she piped in. Here it is. I was confused and thought to myself, uh, okay, it was a room in our left, across from the elevator. The light was out in the room and the door was maybe 30% open. Do you want me to push you inside? I asked. Oh, no, this is fine, thank you. With that, I took four steps to go. I pressed the elevator button, turning around immediately after to look at her, and when I did, the chair was empty. Over four years ago, I went to work at a warehouse in a small town that I'm from. I decided to leave after my health started to get worse physically, and I was diagnosed with panic disorder and severe anxiety after the situation that I'm about to tell you. This changed the way that I developed friendships after that job, that's for certain. So, I started this job on April Fool's Day of 2018, which was odd to me, and I had no kind of high expectation of the job. All I wanted was to do my job, get paid, and go home as I had two children at home, and many things that I could work on there. 
The job wasn't hard and it made pretty good money for all the duties considered, so I really couldn't complain. I worked second shift for about five months and I went to day shift. While working on second shift, I kept to myself mostly, until one day I met someone from one of the lines after we stuck up a conversation about gaming. For the sake of anonymity, we'll name him JF. Well, JF was a pretty good guy and we had a lot of things in common. I went home that night and he popped up as suggested friend on Facebook, again another oddity, so I decided to add him. When I did, we started talking more at work until he suggested that we should hang out, so we did, pretty frequently in fact. We were friends for a month at this point and one day he decided that he was going to introduce me to his partner. She seemed decent at first, super nice, didn't seem to be a judgmental type, so I was cool with her. From then on, I would hang out with him when my kids were spending time with my mother. One time we were talking at a restaurant, and he started to vent to me. Dude, she's such a so-and-so sometimes. The other day I forgot to take the trash out and she threatened to stab me if I didn't. I've never been in a relationship where someone's threatened me, but... She's got good intentions, dude. When he said that to me, I was concerned, but of course, we had only been friends for a month or so. I thought that maybe he was being morbid jokingly, so I sort of chuckled at him. He gave me a pretty serious look and said, I'm not joking, she really did. And that obviously concerned me. Fast forward about eight months. They're still together and we all hang out pretty regularly, forgetting the things that he told me then. One day we were all talking and he seemed a little off that day, so I asked him what was wrong in front of her. He flashed a smirk and said, nothing dude, I'm just a little tired. He didn't have his eyes on me though, he had them on her when I asked that. When he went to work the next day, I asked him again, do you promise to keep this between us? Of course, I agreed. He said that he was breaking up with her and she apparently went a little bit crazy. He said that she grabbed her gun and pointed it at him and said, if I can't have you, then no one will. He said that he defused the situation and is trying to look for a way out. And not really knowing what to say, I just said, you'll figure it out, man. If you need somewhere to go, then you can come and stay with me until you get her out of the house. Fast forward another year, he finally decided to leave her. When he did, she flipped out again. This time, he told her over text. And she said that she was going to find him and kill him. And he was actually out of work that day with a vacation day. He sent me a text that said, Hey, let me know if she comes over to work looking for me. That struck me as odd because I had no idea of the situation that was unfolding at that time. She actually did come to our job as well, and she asked me where he was, and I said, I have no idea. I thought he was with you, and you guys went out of town or something. All she did was roll up her window and drive off. I called him, and I told him that she came by, and he called the police about it. They had found her up the road with a loaded gun in the car. Two months later, he decided to talk to her again, and when he did... He had something to tell me. When he called me, he asked if I had seen her around and I hadn't. He said, I would take some vacation days if I were you. Dumbfounded, I asked him why. And he said to me, because she's out of jail and her cousins are in town trying to find the people that she had personal vendettas with. You're one of them. At that point, I was terrified. I grabbed my kids and I immediately went out of town. I took two weeks off of work and I come to find out that the next day her and her cousins went to the next town over and shot three people in an apartment and killed them. I got the news about it the day after it happened. The reason why he knew that they were coming after me is because they made a Facebook messenger group that he was included in and sent a list of names. Everybody regarded it as spam and decided to disregard the message, but he knew what it was. Three of the names on that list were people that they shot. The fourth name on that list, well, it was mine. 
after they found the evidence and he decided to go public about the group and screenshots that he had, they were all charged with first degree murder. From then on, I was very careful about who I would stick my neck out for because even though he knew the context of that list and her intentions, he decided to not inform anyone else on it. Needless to say, we aren't friends anymore and I dodged a bullet. Literally. On my 19th birthday in September of 2014, I had moved into my first home, a small one bed flat. I was beyond excited to have the freedom and independence that living alone would offer me and quickly set out about buying new furniture, decorations and items for my new home. One afternoon on the bus home after a trip into my local town to buy more household items, an elderly gentleman in his late 60s, if I had to guess, started speaking to me. I've always been a social person that'll pretty much gladly speak to whoever speaks to me, so I engaged him in the conversation, just sort of polite chit-chat about what we'd been up to that day, what our plans were for the rest of it. But upon reaching the stop that I'd be getting off at, he told me that he was also getting off at this stop as he was visiting a friend who lived in a neighboring block of flats. He offered to help me carry my shopping and I agreed. I walked with him to the front of my block and said my goodbyes. He left towards a different block and honestly, I thought that that was that. He didn't enter my building or see which flat belonged to me, or so I thought at least. A few days later, I heard a knock upon my door. I opened it to find the same elderly gentleman standing outside my door. I was quite taken aback considering that he shouldn't have known which flat I actually lived in. He'd also managed to get into the building without ringing my doorbell. And the realization hit me that he would have had to have hidden out of sight to watch which flat that I entered. The block had large windows in the communal area. He quickly forced his way into my home and tried talking to me. I lied and stated that I was about to leave as my friends were expecting me, hoping that this would encourage him to go. He then started trying to grope me under my clothes and I moved his hands away but he kept trying to remove them. I ran to my front door and told him I'm leaving and you need to go. Luckily, he did, but he loitered. I waited to make sure that he'd walk away before walking in an opposite direction and immediately called my dad in tears. We rang the police who were as unhelpful as they could possibly be really. Two female officers who asked me why did you let him into the flat despite me saying that he'd forced his way in. They encouraged me to not press charges as the name and the address that he'd given me in our first exchange were falsified telling me that it would be difficult to prove a lot of paperwork and you'd have to relive it in court if we did manage to find him. I regretfully agreed. I was shocked and scared and the police already were so unsupportive anyway. But it doesn't end there though. This man continued to stalk me for months, regularly appearing at my door, following me when I was out. It wasn't until he was on the same bus as me to town when I went to meet friends that it finally stopped, as this was the first time that I was able to point him out to somebody else. My friends went over and publicly called him out for stalking and harassing me. They threatened him, saying, If we ever hear of you doing this again, you will not be able to use those arms to abuse another person ever again. Leave our friend alone. He quickly scampered away, and thankfully, that was the last that I ever saw of him. But this incident, it shook me. It all happened simply because I was polite to a seemingly innocent elderly man who wanted to help me and make conversation this to say I've never accepted another offer of helping me carry my shopping ever again I guess the lesson here is be careful who you let help you because it might not be good intentions that they have in mind so for context this happened 20 years ago just after Christmas I had just turned six a month prior my mum went out one day and left my then 16 year old cousin to look after me and my two older siblings, brother 8 and sister 11. My cousin decided to take us out to the city which is about 10 minutes from where we lived. We took the bus, walked around the city in incredibly unsafe neighbourhoods with basically another child responsible for us 
and after hours got tired and decided to go home. The city had a central area for the buses, not a bus station but like a sort of huge perfectly square field with some plants and flowers and bushes. Lining all four sides along the streets were a couple bus stops and benches. So basically you could catch several different buses from that area going all over the county or city. Since it was just after Christmas too, the bushes along the field were still covered in Christmas lights. As we waited for the bus, I began to wander away as I admired the lights, my cousin none the wiser. And at some point, I heard a man say hi. I looked up from the bush and he was smiling down at me. Thinking back on it once I got older, it was clear that he was homeless and was probably on drugs too. He had long brownish sort of hair that was wet, teeth that were black along the gums, and his clothes were incredibly dirty and torn and he had several jackets on. None of this really registered in my six-year-old brain, so I just smiled back and said hi. He asked if I liked looking at the lights, and I said yes, they're pretty. He said, and I'll never forget this exact sentence, if you like Christmas lights, I've got some really cool lights at my house that you'll love. You want to come and see them? I eagerly said yes, so he reached down his hand to me, and I took it. We started to walk away, and... We're headed to the corner of the field where a few big buildings were. He said his apartment was just a couple of blocks away so we were headed around the corner of the building when my arm jerked backwards and I turned to see my sister pulling me away from him. This guy too, he didn't say a single word, he just took off instantly running. It took a few years for me to fully grasp the danger that I was in that day. My sister and brother talked about what happened a lot and how scary it was. When I finally got a little bit older, I appreciated how terrifying that all was and how close I was to having my life change or perhaps even end forever. If I had rounded that city corner with him, they never would have been able to find me in time because they wouldn't even know where to start looking before we disappeared around the corner and into the city. It's something that we still bring up sometimes to this day and... It always makes me feel really icky. So what I just experienced is really hard for me to overlook. I guess what I'm trying to say is that you guys win. Ghosts are real. Twice now I've had a, a weird experience in the same place. My grandma's attic once a couple of years ago and just five minutes ago the second time. Let me start with the prequel. To give you an idea, my grandma has a house and the attic is basically like a second floor over the whole house. It's filled with all sorts of things that we dump up there that we don't need. Tools, firewood, old toys from childhoods, etc. Also up there is a short chair and a coffee table. When I take them out of the attic to the balcony, it's my favorite place to smoke in the house. Tobacco, not weed. I really enjoy the view and the wind and sometimes though I'm just too lazy to bring them out and I just smoke in the attic looking around at all the junk. Now one day I was going to go up there when as soon as I stepped foot on the first stair I got a sort of fight or flight response for seemingly no reason. It was the middle of the day I've been in the attic a thousand times. I'm not scared of it at all, in fact. I mean, I'm not a kid or anything, but for some reason I was just getting chills and my heart was beating quickly. As soon as I went up to the last step, I stopped and looked around the attic. I had nothing to be afraid of, but it was just sort of like instinct, I guess. I, I couldn't go into the attic without checking it out first. I spent like 30 seconds just looking into the attic in silence before the courage came back to me to walk forward. While walking towards the table for some reason, I had the thought of, what if a demon's watching me right now and that's why I had a bad feeling? I instantly laughed it off though and thought to myself, let him show himself, I'll show him who's boss. And as soon as I finished that thought, I heard a loud shuffle like somebody's footsteps dragged out onto the ground. I instantly froze midway and just looked in the direction where they came from. I spent at least a minute just looking, frozen, expected a, a big rat or something to pop out from somewhere over there and when I finally got my courage back again, 
As soon as I was about to continue to the table and finally do what I came for, another loud noise froze me. This time, a distorted piano played, and I kid you not, it was the most demonic, out-of-tune chord that you could imagine. Like, a sound a horror movie producer would put on jump scare or something. On cue, I of course immediately dashed towards the stairs, and I noped out of there quickly. I went downstairs, entered the room my family was in, and tried my best to pretend like I wasn't running from a demon. My mother heard the piano though, and she thought that I'd found my childhood toys and was fooling around with them. I went with that story and told her that, surprisingly, the batteries were still holding out. They must be good. I wasn't about to tell my family that I seriously thought that there was a demon in the attic. They would have looked at me like I was crazy. Anyway... After I spent a couple of minutes downstairs regaining my composure, I started to think about things rationally again. I felt ashamed that I got scared of nothing. I mean, I'm an adult, and so I picked up my small balls and went up there again, determined to find that piano and ease my mind forever. I went up, immediately walked up to the place where the sound came from, and picked up off the wall a big garbage bag filled with toys from my childhood. I started taking things out and found it, a cheap Chinese dingy toy piano. I tried pressing the keys, but to my shock, there was no sound. I flipped it around, opened the battery compartment, and had a brain fart when I saw that there were no batteries in that thing whatsoever. I took it down with me, found some batteries and put them in, tried playing it, but still no sound. Unfortunately, that day... I really failed to ease my mind. So over the next couple of weeks, I spent quite some time thinking about that incident. As time went on, I started rationalizing it more and more, I guess, thinking that maybe pianos like that make their final sound when their circuit board finally dies, kind of like parting words or whatever. Maybe the shuffle that I heard was from my own feet, but because of the fear, it sounded like it was somebody else's. The only thing that I couldn't make sense of, though, was... How this piano that has been in that garbage bag for 15 years found energy without batteries to make a sound out of its speakers, and a loud one at that. I even went looking for answers, hoping someone could ease my mind and offer an explanation at one point. In the end, as time went on, I, I guess I just brushed it off and told myself, I'm no engineer, I don't know how currents work and stuff, it could be some weird way that that happened and it was normal and... It was just a coincidence. I went to the attic countless times after that too and nothing else ever happened. No weird sounds, no unexplained paranoia, just peace and quiet as it always was. Well, that is right until today. You see, recently we've been doing construction work on the house every weekend. I go up to the attic 20 times a day at least to fetch something or to have a smoke break. We finished the work and went to bed. And now, before you accuse me of being a skeptic rationalizer, I try to keep an open mind. Recently, I've been getting into trying out astral projection, and it's a nice little meditation gig, I guess. I haven't succeeded yet, but the effects are quite trippy, and it's fun. So, I'm laying in bed, browsing the AP subreddit, before I decide that I'm going to go up there to smoke one last cigarette before I go to sleep. The front door is loud and I don't smoke in the house, so the attic is really the only place that I can go. But, in the same exact way, as soon as I set foot on that first stair, I get this immense feeling that something is amiss. Now, some years have passed since the last time that this happened and naturally, my small balls have grown at least a little bit, so I didn't stop this time. I just went up and sat on my smoke table. I lit my cigarette Remembered the last time that this happened in the piano. Like any sane person, I started a monologue in my head to banish the potential ghosts. My monologue continued until my cigarette went out. And here's a reaction. I don't know if there's demons up here or whatnot, but you can't spook me. I can't touch you right now, but I'm learning this technique that lets me come into your house. Trust me, tonight I'm coming and I'm going to kill you as revenge for when you scared me etc etc now is your last chance to try and scare me so come on just try it and i put my cigarette out quite amused of my own little internal monologue and here we go again 
As soon as I finished my monologue and said, try me, a loud sound as something on my left drags across the floor. This time though, I caught it with my peripheral vision as I turned around. A sack, filled with dried sticks for the fireplace, was moving by itself across the floor, defying the laws of physics. Gravity cannot do that. There's no way that it could move that distance by itself, especially when there's so much friction that it made a loud sound. It's not that heavy, so it can't slide like that or even cause that friction unless somebody is pushing it from the top. At that, I shut up and stayed fixated on this thing, convinced not to let a rat, for example, run away without me seeing it. It didn't move for a couple of seconds, so I went up to it, took all the sticks out, checked every corner of that thing, and there were no rats inside. I put the sticks back in, said out loud, don't touch that again. I said my piece already, and I meant it. If there really was an evil entity up there, I'm going to banish it. Although at that point, I was starting to feel like I was bluffing. I walked back to the stairs, but before I went down, I stopped and looked back at the attic. And although my knees were weak, my arms were heavy, vomit on my sweaty, perhaps even mum's spaghetti, I wasn't going to give in to my fear, so I stared into the void for a couple of seconds to establish my dominance. And again, as if a reply, the sack lightly got dragged, though this time just a little bit for a split second. I spent a couple more seconds looking at it, and then slowly backed away, went down the stairs with a confident walk, shaking a little, I'll admit. Originally, I was going to go to bed, but adrenaline got a little high, so now I'm sitting on the toilet writing this, maybe with a ghost proofreading over my shoulder, who knows. Anyway, this seemingly uneventful experience, I just found it too powerful to ignore. I don't think that I can ever rationalize it, to be honest. There's just too many things on top of each other, like the strong fight or flight reaction that I get before the event, the timing that makes this feel like a reply, the hard to explain sound and movement. I am now a believer and I just can't rationalize things by myself anymore. I don't know if this spirit could be good or bad, so I won't take any extra measures right now, so please, don't reply with like throw salt in it or something. But unless I wake up with a cigarette burn on my cheek and come asking for help with how to banish a demon, then I guess this is how it is for now. I'm going to go upstairs again in a second to smoke one more cigarette and just feel out the vibe. I might spend some more time with monologues up there tomorrow as well, just to see what will happen, but... For now, I really don't know what to make of all of this, and yeah, if you've got any ideas about how this could have happened in a sort of natural way, then I am all ears. Back in university days, I lived in a small three-bedroom apartment with two other roommates. My apartment was on the topmost floor of the building, and also the last room on the floor, corner room. It was numbered 707. Our only neighbor is 706, which has been vacant for a while, so our side of the building is very quiet and sparse of people in general. There are three bedrooms which are adjourned in an upside down sort of L shape, one room in the middle, one room to the left of it, and another room below it. For ease of storytelling, I'll call it the middle room, bottom room, and left room. My own room is the bottom room. Also, to be noted, these are Japanese rooms or buildings, so a wooden flooring, sliding doors, sliding closet inside the room, thin wood panel wall between rooms, all that jazz. The left room and the middle room both had heavy sliding doors as well. Between the middle room and my bottom room, there was a hollow space that is pretty large, a closet with sliding doors as well. It's the closet where you fold and store futons and such, and if you've ever watched Doraemon, then that's the same closet that he sleeps in. Anyway, the story happened on a summer vacation. The owner of the middle room had been away for a few days and won't be back until new semester started. One night, me and the left room owner were chilling in each of our rooms. Left room owner, we'll call her Lefty. She was supposed to leave for summer vacation in a week and has been packing. 
I kept hearing loud thuds and sounds of something heavy hitting the wall or the floor, but I ignored it because I assumed that she was still packing. About 11 o'clock at night, Lefty texted me, Yumi, are you okay? Are you sick? I was really confused. Lefty continued, I kept hearing someone sneezing and coughing. Isn't that you? I said, no, I've been quiet this entire time. Isn't it you who's been moving around and packing boxes? Lefty said, what? I haven't been packing anything at all today. I've been on my bed playing with my phone the entire time. Immediately, I put down my headset and laptop and just sort of sat straight on my bed, looking at the text on my phone, feeling somewhat disturbed. About five minutes later, Lefty came to my room and we both sat together confirming with each other what we heard. She heard someone sniffling and sneezing, but I heard thuds and the sound of something on the floor, like the sound of boxes or something pushed against the floor. We sat in silence in my room and the sound came again. There was a thud and knocks. We looked at each other. We figured it out. She thought the sound came from me and I thought that it came from her. In between our two rooms, the common space is the unoccupied middle room. There was knocking, thuds, sounds of boxes moving, and there were the sound of footsteps for sure. It sounds like a very active person inside the room pretty much the entire night. Neither one of us wanted to go and check it out, so we tried to ignore it and just slept it through. Fast forward to the morning. Lefty is an early riser while I don't wake up until 9 or 10 typically. My bed is on the right side of the door, but I sleep facing the door. I just woke up and I heard a loud thud and footsteps from outside my room, like someone was running, and I saw a short shadow passing through the cracks of my slightly open door. It took my sleepy brain a little while to process this. Running footstep sounds are pretty common because my room is beside the front door, so every school day my roommates would make this commotion outside of my door anyway when they're going out of the house. However, the first thing that I finally noticed was that it was summer vacation, so who would be running in a rush like this on the hallway? The second thing too is that that shadow looked too short to be my roommate. It was the height of a child, if anything. The third, I can see the shadow through the cracks of my slightly open door. So who opened my door? I don't sleep with my door opened. Feeling scared, I immediately texted Lefty and asked her where she was. She said that she had left the house since 7.30 in the morning because it's Sunday and church and all that, and currently she's about to get lunch. She didn't open my door. She didn't touch my room, in fact. It was closed when she left, apparently. I immediately got up and ran out of the house to meet Lefty and told her about it this morning. We decided to drag another friend and ask him to help us check our apartment to see if there's anything or someone in there. The three of us walked into the apartment and towards the middle room. We noticed something weird though. The door was slightly opened. It was a sliding door and quite heavy, so there was no way that it could open by itself. We confirmed that neither me nor Lefty had touched that door since the owner left last week. It was always closed. Our friend opened the door and we immediately felt chills. He asked where did we hear the sound coming from and I said from my room it sounds like it came very close, right on the wall connected between my bottom room and the middle room. That's when we realized too that the wall connected between my room and this middle room where we heard all of this activity, it was inside the closet. My parents would have never allowed for a real Ouija board in the house when I was a kid in the 80s and 90s. Sex, drugs and violence were fine as entertainment, but my seemingly unreligious parents had this weird distance between anything occult or what they would call satanic. And yes, that's exactly how they said the word too. So, maybe 14, mid-90s, hanging out with my band who were just two guys that didn't know how to play instruments, like me, and we just hung out and daydreamed about being rock stars and all that. Think sort of Wild Stallions from Bill and Ted sort of thing. We got on the subject of witchcraft and Ouija boards came up and 
I had the idea to make one after hearing from the goth chick on the bus that they could be more powerful that way. So I got a rectangle cardboard piece and made the most crude Ouija board that I could from memory. The other guys had only seen them in stores like me, so we just kind of put things on as we remembered them. So we made a little planchette out of some thicker cardboard and got to seancing. We asked the standard, are you there sort of questions. The planchette moved and we got answers that made no sense. Seemingly random letters and a few numbers that didn't form words or anything meaningful, I guess. We all assumed that one of us was sabotaging the whole thing. But then I asked if there was anything that we could do to help us understand. With zero hesitation, the planchette darted to the moon and then just as quickly over to the sun image. It felt like we all almost lost our place on the planchette because it was definitely moving on its own at this point. And then it slowly spelled out D-E-S-R-E-V-E-R before making three quick circles around the center of the cardboard, sort of counterclockwise and darting to goodbye. We all kind of sat there with our mouths open for a minute. Bass player said, I only remembered to write down the last letters that it gave us. What does des revere mean? Me being a first year French language student thought that it was des revere and I confidently assumed that it meant the rivers, but I knew that I had no clue. But then the keyboard player says, guys, it says reversed. As in, it was spelt backwards, but the word was reversed. We left to see for ourselves if we had the sun and the moon reversed, and we walked downtown to the nearest department store. And sure enough, the one that we made was almost perfect, to the one in the store that is, except for the one major detail. The sun and the moon were indeed incorrectly placed on my homemade Ouija board. We ran home promptly and... After that, we burnt it in the fireplace, and never again. I live in Melbourne, Australia, and there used to be a mental asylum called Laurendell, built in 1938, but eventually closed down in 1999. I was told about this place and how haunted it was, with people hearing creepy things. I was keen to check it out myself, and more than 10 years later, I still can't explain what happened in those three or so minutes that we were there. So, it was 2011. One night we drummed up this stupid idea because we were bored and had nothing to do. So me and three mates decided to go and check out Laurendale because, I mean, why not? The asylum at the time we went was being prepared to be demolished or renovated for new apartments. So most of the entrances and the windows were boarded up with wood. The building we parked next to was surrounded by a metal makeshift fence to keep people or squatters out I guess and had a security patrolling the grounds. One of my friends was strong enough to lift the metal fence that wasn't properly attached which allowed us to crawl under and get inside the property grounds. It was all fun and games. We were having a good time. The feeling of doing something that you're not allowed to and trying not to get caught. You know the feeling, right? Anyway, we were constantly on the lookout for the security officer patrolling, but also trying to look for a doorway inside. When we finally found one, we one by one walked inside. Scared, mind you, we all put our torches on our phones on and shined the light inside so that we could see. When we walked in the door, it's a sort of small entrance area that leads into a main room. We walked a little closer to the main room to get a better look. There were no windows that we could see, just a, a simple room. This all happened in like 30 seconds, so we didn't get a proper look, but in front of us on the left was a staircase. I think it was leading up to other rooms and stuff, and all the walls were covered in graffiti. We didn't see anything paranormal. It was scary enough just being there, to be honest. It had only been 10-15 seconds of us standing there when... We suddenly heard footsteps approaching. The crunching sound of gravel grew closer and closer from behind us outside. We immediately shut off our torches and were left standing there huddled together in the darkness. We couldn't see anything. In fact, I might as well have had my eyes closed, but they were wide open expecting someone or something to grab me. 
but we had our backs to the door behind us, waiting for the footsteps to hopefully walk by us, thinking that the security guard must have seen us. As the crunching of the gravel was fast approaching us, we all instinctively held each other's hand, waiting for the security to bust us. We stopped breathing as the footsteps came to a halt behind us. The sound was unmistakable. The crunching of the gravel stopped, and we just stood there, that silence was deafening, the darkness swallowing us, none of us were turning around. It felt like an eternity, but we stood there for about 10 seconds waiting for something, anything, a sound or someone to say something behind us or a torch to shine in on us from outside, but nothing. In fact, it wasn't until one of my friends turned around slowly and there was nothing or nobody there finally broke the silence and said let's get out of here and we bolted out of the door and back to our car neither of us saw the security as we raced out of the door as well we got in the car and left and after that we never went back still 10 plus years later i think about those footsteps and how no one was there when we turned around we never heard the footsteps receding too as we stood there in the silent darkness even if it was a weird prank and someone was there too, we would have heard the footsteps running away. It was also eerily quiet, so quiet that you could have heard a pin drop. It just stopped directly behind us and it's something that I'll never be able to explain. And we all remember it exactly the same way too. I wrestled with the memory for a while thinking that I was just misremembering it, but after checking with my mates again after so long, we heard those footsteps behind us. There was no doubt about it. Chalking it down to a scary, unexplainable moment that could have gone very differently if we stayed to investigate. The whole experience was eerie and really unsettling from the moment that we shut our torches off and were left standing there in complete darkness. The very first time I saw these things, I was around six or seven years old. My family was camping at some lake in Oklahoma and I saw, I saw two strange figures. I was standing outside our camper alone and I saw a ghostly white figure. It looked like a preteen girl with long hair and a gown running into the woods, chased by a, a tall thin black figure. I froze and called for my dad who went into the woods where I saw these things, but he saw no footprints or anything. So I moved into a rural property in 2015 and it was my home. In January of 2016, aged 11, I was standing outside and just kind of staring out of the trees on the property. For a solid three seconds though, I made eye contact with this abnormally tall, emaciated, pitch black humanoid. I use quotations around eye contact seeing as it had no eyes. It was just hanging upside down by its knees from a tree branch. Its long arms were touching the ground. If I had to guess, I'd say it was around 7 to 10 feet tall. But I felt a deep sense of dread and I ran inside to tell my dad. When he came back out a few seconds later, it was gone. I hadn't started seeing them again as well until just recently starting in September. On September 28th, my boyfriend, brother, and I were down from the road from my house trying to catch fish at a bridge. I got bored and a bit uncomfy because there were gnats, so I started walking up the road back to my house. I was about halfway there when I saw the figure standing in the center of the road. I froze, it froze, and we stood there for about maybe a minute or two. It was around 9 feet tall and its hands nearly touched the ground. I ran back to the bridge and I waited to walk back home with my brother and my boyfriend. I didn't speak for a solid two hours after that as well. Two days ago as well, I was closing the blinds to a window that my cat enjoys perching at. And one of them was straight outside of the window. It had its face inches from the glass. It seemed to sort of open its mouth... I don't know why this one had a mouth, but in its mouth was a huge bulging eye. I freaked out and curled up in my bed and I didn't sleep that night. 
and today I saw it peeking around a corner in my living room. I don't know what to do and I'm absolutely terrified. Does anyone know anything about this and is there anything that I can do about it? I live in Pennsylvania and there's this creepy house called Raymire's Hollow where a murder took place in 1928. On one afternoon I was hanging out with two of my friends and we were really not doing anything. This was like four years ago and we were just bored teenagers. So I mentioned checking out that house and they never heard about it so once they heard the backstory about it they were down to visit it. When we got there it was pretty light out. It was about maybe an hour away from us. We looked around and imagining where everything took place and just talking about the history of it and all that. If you're from Pennsylvania, then you'll probably know this place. You know that they upped the security over the years there, so we were being respectful and just sort of admiring the property. Once we decided to leave, my friend backed out and we went the wrong way. He ended up coming to a dead end and had to back up into someone's driveway. I was in the back seat, had my head looking at the back window to make sure that he was all good, when out of nowhere, there was this woman there. Long black hair, piercing black eyes, and a white dress, staring at me and keeping eye contact in the doorway of this house. I turned around, freaked out. With tears in my eyes, I looked back, and when I did... There was nobody there. Now, I had to have only looked away for possibly two seconds at most. My friend who was backing up told me that he didn't see anything. My other friend was looking down at his phone, so clearly he didn't see anything. But somehow, I was the only one who witnessed her. I've never felt fear like that before too. The way that she was looking at me, it will never leave my mind. I don't know if I just saw a creepy woman squatting there or if I saw something paranormal, but whoever or whatever it was, it gave me a fright that I'll never forget. I grew up out in the wooded country in Illinois on a short dead end street 10 plus miles from a town. And there were seven houses in the area spread out on two and a half acres of wooded lots or larger even. There were no large wild animals. There aren't bears or similar large animals in the region. And people didn't meander there or show up lost or anything like that. Actually, lost folks or large animals wandering around never happened in the 20 years that I lived there. So please keep that in mind as I tell my story. So when I was a young girl in my early teens, I had a good guy friend a few years older than me who lived next door, Terry. Terry was allowed to go out with his friends much later than I was, and he would sometimes tromp over to my yard after getting home late and throw rocks from gravel area outside at my window just to chat. My bed was right next to the window and I would open the window and we'd sort of whisper stories and generally talk for a bit. My second story window faced our backyard and... His house was to the side of it. I could see his house from my window, in fact, over the shrub trees and walking path to his driveway. I would often know if he was out too. The light was on over the side door entrance, or if he was already home, the light would always be off. At one time, during the summer when my window was open, I heard a car in his driveway dropping him off. I was probably 14 years old and it was around midnight. I heard Terry get out of the car and was talking to his friends. Soon his friends pulled away and I softly called out, as loud as I could without waking my parents, asking Terry to stop by and chat. He didn't respond though as he probably didn't hear me and then I came up with the not so brilliant idea to sneak outside and scare him. I'd spent many years in the woods and learning how to blend in and be silent. As kids, we would often sneak around and scare each other. So I silently sneaked out from the second floor and out of my back garage door which led to our backyard below my window which also led to Terry's house off the side through our gravel area then through a well-worn path through the woods about maybe 25 feet long. My parents had put in a gravel pit around the back of the house probably because nothing much grew to the shade of the oak trees. 
There were 14-inch oak rounds set out as an uneven stepping path in the gravel, and if you stepped off onto the rounds, the crunch of the gravel rocks would give you away. But I picked up my way expertly and silently across the log rounds facing Terry's house. My eyes got accustomed to the dark, and I didn't see him. Also at that time, I heard the door of his house close and the light going off signaling that he went in, likely to bed. I waited a bit as I thought that I saw something move in the woods between our houses, but not on the path that we'd always use. If you didn't use the path, there were wild roses and raspberry plants that had thorns and were painful to walk through if you weren't careful. So I thought that it was odd that he'd be in the woods, but maybe he wanted to scare me like I was plotting to do to him or something. But I saw something human size and dark moving through the woods slowly and pausing every once in a while like me. It was coming closer and I definitely saw it, but it was strange in that it wasn't walking directly to my window to talk. Therefore, I hunched down and waited in silence, wondering if I could still startle him. I still thought that it was Terry and he saw me and snuck out and he was trying to scare me. I watched a dark outline of a human figure moving, but then I would lose sight of it in the foliage. It seemed to be stalking slowly and listening or checking every few feet while hiding. So I whispered after losing patience one last time for Terry, but he didn't answer. I got bored of hiding and crouching, so... I quietly tiptoed back to my garage door and went back inside, silently looking up as I went. I snuck back upstairs to my room above the area where I was just standing or crouching. My window was open and I definitely heard someone or something walking around the yard. I whispered again for Terry out of my window but got no answer. Then I heard someone or something fall and grunt or moan pretty loudly in the window well right below my window. It wasn't enough to wake my parents, but definitely loud enough that I didn't mistake it, and it sent a shock of fear through me. If you aren't familiar with a window well, it's a semicircle hole connected to the house, dug out about three or four feet deep and reinforced with metal. It allows a basement window to be put in below ground level, and the hole lets some natural light in. But there was no way Terry would have fallen into our window well. But we had been playing hide and seek and many outdoor games for years since we were young around the whole neighborhood. We knew everybody's window wells and house footprints, plus paths in the woods, like the back of our hands. And the grunt sounded human-ish and not like an animal. It also pulled itself out quietly without a lot of thrashing. It was around this time too that that was when I realized that this wasn't a fun game and somebody or something was out there and it wasn't Terry. I tried to look outside my window as best as I could but there was a screen on my windows to keep the bugs out so I couldn't lean my head out the window to see next to the wall of our house directly below me. I then heard the crunch of rocks or whatever as it was stepping in this noisy gravel. Again, Terry would know where the log rounds were and would not step in the gravel. He knew my parents were pretty strict and he was as good at being quiet as I was. Whatever it was though, it stopped and I held my breath. I pretty much sat there with my face pressed against the screen two stories up for probably half an hour. It seemed like an hour but I'm sure that I didn't have patience back then to wait that long. But I never heard it, him or her leave but... I grew tired and eventually I just fell asleep on my bed that was next to the window. Now, there are a few things that I'm certain of. One, it was not Terry. I asked him later too and he said that he went to bed that night when he got home. He also would have no reason to lie so it just makes no sense for it to be Terry. I'm pretty sure that it wasn't one of our neighbors too and I can't think of any reason that a person would be there. We had a few neighbors and only two other houses out of seven had kids. Again, too, these seven houses were spread out in two and a half plus acres per home. There weren't any big animals in the area, too, like I said. And as wooded as the whole area was, we only had some deer, but they were hunted and didn't come close to homes ever. Plus, our dog scared them away all the time, so that just doesn't make any sense. And all I can put it down to is that... 
that night, I was out there in the woods with a stranger who apparently followed me all the way back to my own home. So I bought a Ouija board at a garage sale decades ago because I always liked the design of the board. I did try it once with a friend and a girlfriend, but nothing really happened. Very, very slight movement possibly was all really, but no messages and so I left the board out as decoration but never really used it again. But I did try it again with just the girlfriend one time later and it actually worked. It took a while to get going, but once it did, we were shocked at how quickly and deliberately it seemed to move, and we kept asking each other, are you sure you're not pushing it? We apparently talked with more than one individual that night, including a mischievous one called Eight that showed up more than once. We would be talking with someone, then the answers would become sort of nonsensical, and we would ask, who is this, and it would confess Eight. After an hour, the pointer or device was moving around really fluidly and we were both laughing and amazed and constantly accusing the other person of moving it. I know that I was barely touching it and honestly it looked like she was too. I'm sure that I would have felt it if she were pushing it at the speed that it was going as well. It was more like we were trying to keep up with it I guess but I have a sense of how the trick might work based on little jitters from tired arms but... This was moving around far too fast for that, I thought at least. What I'm getting at is that it was really weird and I don't think that I can explain it. At one point though, we got in touch with someone claiming to be Mary, who knew my girlfriend. My girlfriend couldn't figure it out, but then she remembered a girl back in high school by that name and asked if it was her. In response, the device went over the we in the Ouija board a brand name at the top and then my girlfriend remembered that she had known a girl named Mary from French class who had apparently died and we is obviously French for yes and that was one of those really goosebumpy moments. We asked Mary some things about where she is now and what it's like there and then while we were thinking of what to ask next the device started moving and spelled out who's he Super freaky, but also made sense since I had not gone to school with them. So we said, oh, this is, and gave them my name, and then it spelled out hi. Well, we kept asking questions and getting responses, and then at one point I made a joke, wondering how it all works. I suggested that maybe there are Ouija boards positioned around heaven, like customer service phones at the airport, and they announce it over the PA system when you have an incoming call. While well, my girlfriend and I are giggling at my dumb joke, the device moves very quickly over to no, then does two very fast loops around the board, and on the third one flies right off the board and into the wall across the living room. Yes, this really happened and we were both stunned and both certain that we hadn't done that, and pretty sure that the other person had, but we both insisted that we were just as surprised and scared as the other. To this day, it remains a pretty inexplicable experience. Not just the ending, but all of it too. I don't really have an explanation for the speed at which that thing moved around the board, or how it flew so far with such a, a short runway, with our fingers barely touching it. To this day, I'm really not sure what to make of the experience. I will say though that I left the board on display, but... After that, I dumped the planchette and I never used it again. So I've never really told anyone about any of this because, well, I don't believe in the paranormal. I always thought that it was just rubbish, made up stuff and honestly, I still don't believe in it, but since this event, I still don't understand if it was real or if my mind projected something weird for a few minutes. This situation happened four years ago. It was January and I was alone in my apartment in the summer but my parents would come for a visit in a few hours. 
It was too hot and almost night and I had the great idea of taking a cold shower. Since there was nobody home, I didn't close the door of the bathroom, but the shower glass door was closed all the time. And while I was taking a shower, I saw something walking in front of me outside the bathroom and this thing went to the left and to the right four times. The first time I thought that it just could have been my imagination, but the second time, the figure passed through the bathroom. I turned off the shower and yelled, anybody here? I thought it was my parents, but nobody answered. The figure made the same trajectory, right, left, right, left. The fourth time, the figure stopped outside the bathroom and it sort of seemed like it was looking at me for 10 to 15 seconds. Then, the figure went to the left and I opened the door. I yelled again, but nobody answered. I got out of the bathroom and walked to each part of the apartment and nobody was home. Only me. So the wife and I we live in a pretty decent area. Nicely cared for homes, trimmed yards, fairly friendly neighbors for the most part. However, we're just a couple of houses off a main street where there are a number of duplexes. We rent in a converted home from the early 1900s that's a duplex too, so no shade on that. But some of which seem to partake in, uh, let's just say, illegal activities. Strangers parking on our street for five minutes to an hour, sometimes leaving someone in the vehicle, sometimes parked for days at a time. Anyway, I know the signs. But there's also a fairly large homeless encampment within half a mile, so we get the occasional colourful character roaming through looking for recycling, something not nailed down or open car doors. You get the idea, but I digress. So one Friday night around 10pm, there's a knock on our door. No one visits us without a heads up or an invitation, especially that late, but I thought maybe one of our neighbours needed something. Now... I'm a bit paranoid, I'll admit. Security conscious? Yeah, so I never just go and open the door. During the day, I would look out of a side window before looking through the glass at the top of the door. But due to the hour, it's dark out, so the side window isn't really an option. Also due to the hour, even if it is a neighbor, my security mind itself says that this is all wrong, so I grab my handy dandy, I'll let your imagination fill in the blank here, I walk over to the door and flip on the porch light. I have to stand on my tiptoes to see out the little block windows at the top of the door. And there's a guy there staring at me, about my height, six foot, scruffy facial hair, shaved head, looking a little ticked off and maybe a bit speedy as well. The stranger says I'm looking for and sort of garbles. I say, sorry, who? He says, Kevin. There's no Kevin here, man, I say. He said that he'd be here, though. He should be here, the guy says. You got the wrong address, or you got fished, man. Can I use your phone? Uh, no, sorry. Good luck. I just stared at him until he turned around and walked down the steps. Then I turned off the porch light and went over to the blinds to watch him wander down the street. I don't know if the guy was legitimately lost or looking for some fool to just open their door, but I don't take chances. Even during the day, unless I ordered something that I know I need to sign for and you can't properly identify yourself, you can leave it on the porch and I'll get to it when I get to it. The door stays closed. Trying to kick it in? Good luck, because I've bolted that sucker and the odds will not be in your favor. Again though, I don't know if the guy was legitimately lost or if he was just looking for somebody to open their door to do who knows what. Something tells me though that he wasn't lost. So when I was a kid, I was walking through the woods with a friend one day. Keep in mind too that this was before everyone had cell phones. We were looking for good wood to build a hut or something, I think, but after looking around, we spotted a white rope around a tree. 
As kids, we were scared and sort of slowly approached the tree because we didn't know what it was. And then we spotted a leg with no pants on. We sort of edged our way around the tree and we could see a, a fully undressed man with a, a sack over his head and he didn't seem to move. At that, we ran to a busy bike path 200 meters further, running and asking people to stop and listen. One older guy wanted to help, but his wife was like, no, it's a joke, and they walked away. So both still scared for this guy, as maybe he needed help or something, we went back. And yeah, he was just still sitting there. We approached slowly. He hasn't seen us because we approached from the back. When all of a sudden, he moves. In fact, he just stood up, removed the ropes, and we stayed hidden and looked on in silence. The man removed the mask, dropped it on the ground, and walked away to another part. Bear in mind, he's totally naked, walking like nothing happened. We followed him for some distance. He never looked around or said anything. We also kept silent too, because if we had said anything, we would have been spotted. When we reached the path, a random woman came on her bike and started talking to him. I guess that she knew him because she greeted him and asked about his walk or something. My friend then stood on something and made some noise. I think a branch snapped. They looked up at us, so at that, we ran away. I don't know what was going on there that day, but it was a really strange circumstance and something that's always stuck with me. So, for a couple of weeks now, I've been seeing humanoid figures in my room, like standing on the edge of my bed or beside it or behind items. They look like shadows and they just stand there, sometimes sort of swaying. I've had some mental health issues lately and I realized that they could be hallucinations, but the hallucinations that I've had are very different to this. For ages, I've been waking up between 1 or 3 a.m. for some reason, and just recently I've started seeing these shadow people. One particular one that stands out is this weird thing, really. It had hollowed out eyes that were almost pitch black. It had long fingers that were like 4 inches long. I use metric, so I'm not exactly sure, but its skin was pale and it had a hat on its head. In fact, I'm not sure if it was a hat, I guess, but the hat was like two long cones that were black and white striped across of it. It peeked out from behind a box in my room, then went back behind it. When I shined my flashlight on my phone towards it, there was nothing. Now, I would just chalk all of this up to hallucinations, but I've had other weird things happen too, like my blanket being pulled or tugged on, or a feeling like something is on it or holding it down. These are very physical experiences too, and I really don't know what to make of them. Does anyone know what to do about any of this and what precautions I should take? I'm losing a lot of sleep over this too, and I would like a, a fast solution if that's possible, because, man, I'm absolutely exhausted. So, for context, I'm an 18-year-old female who used to work at a 24-hour subway. I worked there for almost two years until I quit this past July. For over a year, I was one of the store openers and would get there around 7 in the morning to start tasks. Keep in mind, I would usually be alone until around maybe 9 or 10 when another co-worker's shift would start. And even though I only have a few scary stories from my two years of working there which all in all is pretty good considering how long I was there for, I and some of my old co-workers still believe that it was haunted. So one morning when I was alone, I was standing in the back when I heard from the front a woman's voice saying hello three times. It was almost like a loud whisper, I would say, and of course my first instinct is that the bell that we have on the door didn't work and a customer is out there waiting. Except when I walked out to the front, there was no one there. Not even a car outside of the store. The song on the radio was a familiar song from the 90s, sang by a male artist. So there was no way that it could have been that. 
and why would an artist put background vocals of a creepy whisper in a song anyways? In fact, I remember hearing the first hello and turning my head and listening more carefully as it said hello two more times, so I know for a fact that I didn't imagine it. After this instance, I had another, a while later, where I was in the back and heard one of our bread cabinet doors slam shut out front. This is a very distinct noise for anyone who has worked in a subway because we are constantly getting bread and closing the cabinets. Immediately after I heard it shut, I ran out the back to, again, see nothing. No customers, no cars out front, nothing. We also don't like to keep bread cabinets open since air could get in and make the bread stale, so I know for a fact that I didn't leave it open for the wind to shut it. My last story happened more than once on different occasions and I would like to think that this was the spirit messing with me and wanting me to think that I was crazy. Again, I would be in the back alone when I would hear what sounded like somebody sweeping the floor in the front towards the cash register. It was a sort of swooshing noise that would happen over and over again for at least three seconds at a time. The thing is, is that I would move slightly and it would start, and when I stopped moving, it took another second for it to stop, so I knew that it wasn't me making the noise. For example, I would take a step and there would be a swoosh, I would stop, and it would swoosh again, and then it would stop. It would happen sometimes five times in a row until I would walk to the front that is like three feet away and see nothing again. Also, it would only ever happen when I was alone and would start to happen when I was just sitting or standing around on my phone in the back. I feel like the spirit, or whatever it was, wanted me to think that I was the one making the swoosh noise while also making me feel creeped out at what I was hearing. Also, whenever I heard the swooshing noise, I pictured a woman with blonde hair and a white dress, which I don't know why, but it just popped up in my head when I heard it. At the time of these things last year, I was in a bad mental place and exhausted from always being out of the house at school, work, or competitive dance, which is why I feel like the spirit only really showed itself to me because, I don't know, I think I was a bit low and didn't have many friends at school and all that. Even though those are my only experiences, I I still feel as though there was a woman's spirit roaming around somewhere in that subway, as crazy as that sounds. A few years ago, I was working at a pizza chain in my hometown as a driver. I was 27, but made some pretty good money delivering, let me tell you. I had worked at a few other places, both local and chain in the years before, and still work as a dasher on occasion, even after this happened. But now I choose to deliver in much safer areas for this reason. I got luckier than I could have ever imagined. So one night, I was working and had a double, two deliveries to take. Both were cash orders. I had $12 left in my bank what drivers are given to use as change for cash orders, so you don't have a ton of cash on you at all times. The first order, it went smoothly. The guy gave me 50 for a $35 order, so I was excited about the nice tip. I drove to the second delivery. It was at an apartment complex with multiple buildings. I had delivered there before. The sun was about to set, but it was still pretty light out. The chain that I worked at had us drive company cars with the logo on it, all white sedans, and this is important. I grab the order and I go to the door to the apartment building. A young guy comes out and a much bigger older guy was outside smoking a cigarette. The big guy went inside as the smaller guy came out. He looked around sort of nervously and asked how much he owed me. The way he was looking around though just made me very nervous all of a sudden. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. I told him the amount and he said that that wasn't what he was told on the phone. Something was wrong and it was then when I felt someone else walk out behind me from the door as the first young guy looked around down the parking lot, craning his neck as if he was looking for someone. I told him the amount again and broke down the order for him trying to keep calm and then all of a sudden the first guy held a gun right to my temple. I also felt a poke on my spine because there were two gunmen. I couldn't speak. Words wouldn't form no matter how hard I tried. 
Give me your money and your keys now, the first guy growled, and I fumbled immediately for the keys. I gave him everything, but hadn't realized the 50 was mixed in, and I gave him the keys trying my best to remain calm. Another guy came up from my left. He had sort of uh, poofy hair and was around the same age as the first kid. The one behind me I hadn't seen yet. The big hair kid grabbed the pizza bag and ran off and hid. The first kid searched the company car. Luckily, I'd left my wallet in my personal car. I saw him grab my cell phone, though, and that's when the panic began to set in. I had pictures on that phone that I hadn't backed up of my five-year-old son, who absolutely is my world. So I said, please, please don't take that. I have pictures of my son who died on there. It's all I have of him, please. I lied. My son is very much alive. The kid behind me spoke softly. Trust me, just listen to him. You'll get it back undamaged. I don't want to be here either. I could tell that he'd been crying by how his voice sounded. A car began pulling up and the three boys took off to the other end of the complex in a full sprint. Before the one behind me ran, he dropped the gun in front of me. Standard issue 9mm silver and black and safety off. Looked completely real to me. He picked it back up and ran with the others. The car that pulled in saw me. It was a woman and her kid. Panic set in as I realized that they could possibly come back and do way worse to me as the sky started to get dark. But I collapsed. They had taken my company car keys, $72, the pizza, and my phone. The woman ran up to me and asked if I was alright. She took me into her apartment in the next building over and we locked the door. I was shaking so hard I, I couldn't even hold her phone to talk to the 911 operator as she set down her kid. Her boyfriend, I assumed, helped me call. I spoke to the operator and told her everything. I'm actually colorblind and these guys were obviously wearing all black and white clothes, thank God. I had a full description of the two of them though and the poor woman who helped me was going to be late for work but she still stayed until I was off the phone and the cops had shown up. And man, she was harsh and blunt with the operator, let me tell you, but I will never forget this woman's utter kindness to me and her boyfriends as well. The cops showed up though and contacted my store and my manager brought out the spare keys for me to drive the car back to the store. After dealing with the cops, I drove back and was greeted by crying and beyond worried co-workers. All of them were terrified that I was hurt. It meant a lot to me how much they cared, but I told them that I was alright. I filed the proper paperwork and the 72 was written off as a loss to the store. Thank God, because I had worked other stores that made you pay back the money out of pocket if you got robbed to prevent drivers from stealing. I was told by the owner to take the rest of the night off and take care of myself. He gave me a hug and he was, to this day, one of the best bosses I've ever had. What I didn't know, though, was I was in for a very long night. I called my best friend before I left the store from the store phone and asked where he was. We usually met up for drinks after work. He was around the corner at a bar, so I met up with him. His dad was a District 4 cop in my city at the time, the same district that this happened in. He told me that his dad had given him a heads up and he had two shots waiting for me to calm my nerves. After the two shots, we began playing pool when his dad called his phone and asked if I was with him yet. He said yeah and handed me the phone. His dad asked if I could come to the station. I was honest and told him that I'd had two shots so he sent out a squad car to get me since it wasn't that far away. We get to the station and they actually had the suspects in custody and I was needed to ID them. There were three boys and a driver and they had been caught less than 20 minutes after the robbery speeding. The BOLO had already gone out and they matched the description. They had used the money to buy weed and gas and they had taken off. They had at least 15 stolen cell phones on them. The order had been placed on a stolen phone and my phone was in the mix with the box. The police told me to grab my phone only and I did. They asked me to unlock it. It had fingerprint verification so that was easy. Nine of the ten tries to unlock it had already been used before my phone would have completely reset. And in and it unlocked. I told the police every detail yet again. Although my parental instincts kicked in, I told them the guy behind me quite obviously was bullied into this and to show mercy. He was the one with the white t-shirt. 
The police went wide-eyed and told me that he was the one talking. The other three denied involvement, and that's when I found out about the fourth guy, the driver. He found out later that he was completely unaware of the robbery and was just picking up his friends. He was never charged. The boy who was behind me though and the one who grabbed the pizza were 15 and 16 and got six months of house arrest. The only reason the one behind me got off easy, despite having the gun to my back, was because I asked them to go easy on him and that he was a good kid who just didn't want to be there. He was also the only one confessing and it makes sense since he had even said the other guy wouldn't have the phone for long. He was planning on going to the cops had they not been caught but the other guy, the first kid who put the gun to my temple, it was his 18th birthday and he got the book thrown at him. In the courtroom he actually made fun of me as well and was laughing at me. Seeing him made me panic a bit. The judge scolded him for his behavior and he just grinned and glared at me with a joker-like smile. All I could see was pure evil. This kid, I'm sure of it, will commit way more crimes. I have no doubt that he's eventually going to end someone's life, in fact, and you could just see how cold he was just by looking in his eyes. I grew up in a town full of murderers and abusers, and I had never seen this kind of evil in my life before. Quite honestly, too... I don't ever want to see it again. I asked to have my name stricken from the records and I asked to remain anonymous in case he ever got out and I'm so glad that I did that because today I got a letter from the state. He's being released in February. The court only had my old address at my parents' house and my mum didn't think the letter was important. I missed the deadline to protest his release for probation. The plea deal was eight years and... It's only been four. Also, he's getting out early due to overcrowding. Not good behavior, but overcrowding. This coming February, and I'm ready if he finds me. My wife, my parents, everyone I know, knows his face and name. And if he tries anything, we're all ready. And for his sake, I really hope that we don't ever meet again. So I, a 19-year-old female, was asked to sing at a naturalization ceremony in my city by my old vocal teacher. My aunt works in the building next door and came to watch and record me to watch later. I'm relatively small and have yet to meet someone who I can truly say I got bad feelings from. I wore a formal dress, not too long, not too short, and shorts underneath because the forecast said that it would be windy that day. The building was about three blocks from the nearest parking garage and since it was mid-workday, all the street parking was full or cut off by construction. So, after the naturalization ceremony finished, I went with my aunt to get lunch and hang out in her office. After we finished eating, she walked me to the corner of her office and said that she would watch me walk the next few blocks and turn the corner. I never walked to that area of town alone before. I was super tired and busy trying to make sure my dress didn't fly up along with my hair and my face. I just wanted to get to my car and get home. When suddenly, this man stepped in front of me and asked where the district court was, where the naturalization took place, so I knew where that was at least, and I pointed behind me and kept walking. My aunt texted me and told me to call her once I turned the corner. I did so and she asked who the man was. I told her that he asked where the court was and I showed him. She told me to keep walking and let her know when I get to my car. Once I got to my car I let her know and she said that he followed me down the block until he looked back and saw her watching with her phone out. She said that upon seeing her he turned off another road quickly and began walking away with something in his hand and made sure that I was okay while being on the phone with me. I got home and I was shaking the whole time because... That could have ended a lot differently. In fact, I could have not come home that day. I might not have even made it to my car, in fact.